Good morning, everyone. I am Juliette Morangello, the Associate Dean for Academic Affairs at Widener Law Commonwealth. It is my pleasure to welcome all of you this morning to our annual law review symposium, Contemporary Legal Issues Facing Education. Dean Hussey is sorry that he couldn't be here to welcome you, but you will meet him later this morning. Because we are the only law school in Pennsylvania's state capital, it is important to us at Widener Law Commonwealth to participate in the important policy discussions affecting Pennsylvanians. Our law review students have put together a terrific program today on a topic of vital importance to our citizens, education. It seems that every day we see new legal issues facing education, and today we have a wonderful lineup of speakers to discuss some of those issues with us. I am excited to learn today from our distinguished speakers, and I hope that you are as well. Thank you for joining us. I'll now turn the program over to Professor Christian Johnson, the Law Review's faculty advisor. Uh, thank you, Dean uh, Morangello. I've had the honor over the past five years to serve as the faculty advisor for the Law Review. And the Law Review, of course, is composed of some of the best and brightest law students that we have at the law school. And it's been a wonderful experience there. Uh, next year, I'll be turning the torch over to Professor Quinn Yergain, who will serve as the faculty advisor. And he's been a terrific resource this year in helping us organize the, uh, the program. As Dean Morangello mentioned, each year, the Law Review organizes a symposium. And this has been done since the, uh, since the launching of the uh, Harrisburg campus back in uh, 1989. And the Law Review organizes a symposium of their own choosing. They then publish articles from the participants of the program about the different topics that are discussed during the year. Uh, we're excited to participate this year in their program, Contemporary Legal Issues in Education. Uh, during the program, uh, all of the, uh, the audience will be muted. If you have questions, please go ahead and send those questions in via the chat function that's uh, part of Zoom. The moderators will make every effort to, uh, to respond to those questions, but, uh, but th that will have to be time permitting. Uh, in addition, uh, due to time constraints and other issues, uh, Attorney General Michelle Henry uh, won't be able to take questions this year. Um, I will now turn the time over to Jane Machetti, who is the Law Review Symposium Editor, who will be conducting the, the symposium. Jane has spent countless hours in making invitations, uh, tweaking our program, organizing the themes, and making sure that the program is a great success. I'll now turn the time over to Jane. Thank you, Professor Johnson. Good morning. Um, thank you everyone for joining us today for what's going to be a very exciting and informative symposium. Before we start, I'd like to thank Brian for the technical support, Mark for all the help with the CLEs, and of course, our panelists and moderators. The overwhelming response we received with the number of registrants for this symposium speaks to the polarizing discussions regarding education in uh, the Commonwealth. On a daily basis, we see education and school topics appearing above the front page fold. Books being banned, equal opportunity and access, gun violence, school tax reforms, and the list goes on. Today's diverse group of panelists will provide perspectives and insight from all areas, from the student whose rights have been infringed upon to a local school board member who has to make tough decisions between finances and quality education. To set the stage for a lively day, we're delighted to have with us a former graduate of Widener Law Commonwealth who credits participation in intensive trial advocacy program, Moot Court and Central Pennsylvania Law Clinic and providing her the necessary preparation for the legal profession. She dedicated over 20 years of her legal career to the Bucks County District Attorney's Office, taking on critical jobs such as Chief of Major Crimes, Chief of Child Abuse Division, 
and first assistant. She was appointed Bucks County District Attorney in bipartisan vote in 2008. She has been a leading advocate for children throughout her career, prosecuting major child abuse cases and launching the Bucks County Children's Advocacy Center. She has pushed major initiatives and took a leading role in educating junior prosecutors across the Commonwealth. During her tenure as first Deputy Attorney General, she was admitted into American College of Trial Lawyers, which is one of the premier legal associations in North America, and received the Widener University Commonwealth Law School 2017 Excellence in Public Service Alumni Award for her extraordinary contribution to public service. On March 8, 2023, which also happened to be an International Women's Day, she was confirmed as the top law enforcement officer in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. It gives me a great honor to introduce as our keynote speaker today, the Honorable Michelle A. Henry, Attorney General for the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. Well, thank you um, for that very kind introduction. And thank you, um, Professor Johnson and everybody that worked so hard to organize this important symposium. Um, I'm honored to be here at my alma mater, even virtually, um, and I'm honored to have been invited to speak to all of you on this um, important issues that, that we've, we're gonna talk about today, um, and honored to be a part of the distinguished panel of speakers that are here today. I think this is such important work and so many um, issues that really are, um, concerning and, and deserve our attention. So thanks so much for having me here today. I have to say, when I thought about what I wanted to say or share with you um, on this topic of contemporary legal issues in education, I couldn't help but hearken back to my childhood. Um, now I'm gonna date myself and make myself feel old, but um, I grew up in the 70s and 80s in Greensburg, Pennsylvania. I went to public high school, um, elementary school, middle school. And um, I don't know if it's nostalgia, but when I think back to those times, I do think back to what I see as a simpler time. Um, and again, it was, it was, there was just comparing today to back then, when I think about my, my elementary school and the education that I got there and what my context or what my world looked like, the reality was that, that my world essentially consists of my friends in the neighborhood and my friends at my elementary school. And so, and quite frankly, they were sort of the same group because we walked a block up to school and um, you know attended elementary school there. And my days were, I was either at school or I was outside playing in the neighborhood. We were playing kickball, dodgeball, kick the can. Um, and the way that we knew it was time to come home would be that my mother would stand outside and ring a bell and let us know it was time to come in either for dinner or that it was getting dark out. And that was really what my world looked like in, in elementary school. And then as I got older in middle school, and high school and was socializing with my friends. And I have to say my core group, I had a core group of girlfriends who to this day are my best, best friends. And we laugh sometimes when we think about how we communicated or how we socialized. And you know what we did back then wasn't texting with each other and it, it wasn't uh, snaps, but it was, you know, I'd fight my brother to, to get on the phone, which was tethered to the wall with a phone cord. And um, we would, uh, you know, spend hours talking on the phone and trying to stretch that phone cord as far as we could to get privacy. And um, that was the way that we socialized um, and communicated with each other. And if something happened at school, if there was a fight, which of course happened sometime, or somebody was being bullied maybe in the lunchroom, those were difficult. But the, the difference was that when we got home, when I walked through the front door of my house, I was in a safe haven. And that was left behind. And that was 
in school. And I was now in the, the, the four walls of my house where it was safe and um, that was left behind. And um, those events that occurred there uh, stayed there. I also think about, you know, what we were, what we were told to do or trained when we had safety drills. And that consisted of twice a year, we would line up and we would practice a fire drill and we would, you know, all line up, be accounted for and go outside. And that was what our world looked like in terms of um, sort of socializing, interacting um, and, and, and school at that time. And um, the truth is that world and that educational environment does not exist at all anymore. And we know that, we know that that's because of technology and smartphones and the access that is virtually limitless for kids. Um, it's not just that they have access and, and can communicate with their friends 24 hours a day, seven days a week, either by snap or by texting, but they can communicate with strangers all over the country. Um, all over the world through Instagram, through TikTok. They can follow their favorite band. Um, they can uh, look at the most popular uh, TikToker and watch them. They can, um, if they were so inclined, they could get an update on, on the war in Ukraine. Their, their ability to communicate and connect is, is just a button away. And um, that is a tremendous difference from obviously back when I was in school and looking at that from a perspective of a longtime prosecutor and, and the um, attorney general's office, unfortunately, what that also means is that there's an increase in the pool of potential victims, whether it's um, scammers or drug dealers or child predators, um, the ability for um, these individuals who have the intent to do harm is that they have such a wider net now. It no longer is confined by proximity. Um, one example that I can think of is that recently, as you know, the Office of Attorney General, we have a child predator section. And that section works 24-7 to um, go online and find individuals that are either using their, their cell phone or their laptops um, and social media to, to uh, get to their victims. And so they work um, to, to, to battle that. And we had a case involving a situation where a mother um, had reached out to the police and um, had learned that her 14 year old daughter uh, had been um, contacted by an older man. And that older man who was 41 years old had, had snuck into the parents' house when they didn't know it and had sexual relations and, and sexually abused this 14 year old. So she, of course, when she learned of this, reached out to the police and our agents um, immediately uh, started to investigate this case. They did um, forensic analysis of the cell phones and the, and the computer. And what they found was that it wasn't um, just that what he had done that weekend, but the reality was the communication clearly showed that he intended to come back. Um, and he discussed um, with the 14 year old that he was going to disable the um, security cameras around the house that the parents had um, and discussed how he was going to come back and what he was going to do to the girl of a sexual nature. Um, and so our agents tracked this individual, this 41 year old man down and he was in California and he was a registered sex offender and he had traveled from California to Pennsylvania. And I think, you know, that case just shows that the, the, the victim, again, it's no longer close proximity, um, but, but it's the ability to, to have that wider net. And, and I think about that and how, how scary that really is for kids and for parents. I mean, parents can um, know who's around their child. They can um, screen their babysitters, get background on the, the handyman. Um, obviously, teachers, coaches, educators um, go through a background process, but the reality is the individuals are coming through the phones and the computers. And um, 
that has changed so much. The same thing is true with bullying and, and the fights that I was discussing that stayed in the schoolyard or stayed in the classroom. Um, now they continue well beyond uh, the school day. And you know we've seen the studies and statistics, 59% of children have been bullied and harassed online. And um, when you can no longer um, go to that safe haven, they're no longer relegated to just the schoolyard and there is no safe haven, that, that's a real concern. And that's dramatically different. And we know that that kind of harassment and bullying can happen 24 hours a day, seven days a week. I think back to a case a couple years ago, many of you will probably remember it. I think it was in Massachusetts. It involved a um, 17 year old um, girl that was texting with her boyfriend and um, the boyfriend was struggling with some mental health issues and the um, 17 year old had texted him hundreds and hundreds of times and had encouraged him to commit suicide. Um, and ultimately and tragically he did. And that case was prosecuted. That 17 year old who was texting her boyfriend and encouraging him to do this was ultimately charged um, with involuntary manslaughter and a jury convicted her. Um, and, and ultimately she, she had the consequence of that. And when I think back to, to my career as a prosecutor, I couldn't have ever envisioned a case where somebody was so far removed uh, in terms of distance and proximity, but yet um, the, the kind of case that we saw um, there. So I think that when we think about these changes, um, they're significant. And I guess, um, as, as was mentioned earlier, um, when we think about how a school prepares for safety measures and does drills, now it's staff and students preparing for an emergency and that emergency is active shooter drills. Um, it's no longer fi just fire drills. It's students and teachers now practice what to do. If somebody comes through the school doors um, with a gun or guns um, and starts shooting at them. And when we think about this, we certainly don't have to think far back. Just last week in Nashville, um, three adults and three nine-year-old children were killed. In May of last year, an 18-year-old killed 19 elementary students at a school in Texas. In February of 18, 14 students and three adults were killed in Florida high school by a 19-year-old. Um, and really, I could go on and on, sadly. This is just the, the, the iceberg. And, you know, I think when Columbine happened in 1999, it shocked the nation, if not the world. Um, and since then, there's been 376 school shootings. And um, these tragedies have become all too commonplace. And gun violence, you know, apparently knows no age. When we think about the fact that now for years, there's been these active um, shooter drills. What happened um, earlier this year, I think e even given all that we have seen when a six-year-old boy comes into a school with a gun and shoots his first grade teacher. I mean, again, thinking about what, what could we be contemplating and ready for? What do we need to be thinking about students who are at the age of six might be carrying firearms? Um, and, and, and it's shocking. Um, so, you know, when I think back to this, I can't help but, but feel like it's a much more complicated world than when I was growing up. Um, but I don't wanna start the morning off with all doom and gloom. It's important that we acknowledge that complicated doesn't always mean worse. Um, in many ways, kids attending school today have opportunities unheard of a few decades ago. Um, when I think about when a, when a kid needs to research a paper or learn about a topic or has an interest, um, all they need to do is access the internet. Um, educational materials are no longer confined to, well, is the library open? Or do my, do my parents have encyclopedias? They now have the ability at their fingertips to access all kinds of information. Um, so 
the ability to have that is unbelievable and such a a, a great asset to our kids um, growing up. And also when we think about social media, it also connects people in new and positive ways. Uh, friendships can be forged and maintained regardless of distance. Students with unique or unusual hobbies or interests can find online communities um, in a way that they never could who, with people that share the same passion as theirs. Um, social media allows for new forms of activism among students who are concerned maybe with social justice or political issues. Um, kids who want to share a forum with maybe their artistic or musical talents now all they have to do is upload a video or a photograph and they've reached such a wider audience of, of potential individuals that share that interest or are fans. Um, and also schools as a result of this have become as, as well as society far more inclusive than it used to be. In the 70s and 80s, um, there was no LGBTQ, it didn't exist. And its members uh, were largely unrecognized and uh, disdained. And now um, that community is vibrant, diverse, seen and heard in a way that it never was before. And when we think about discussions around race, um, they have been reinvigorated with um, more and more people of all races as they grapple with concepts such as implicit bias and how best to teach historical racism um, that has opened up a, a, a new world. And so with these new opportunities, and I think about it a lot, come the new challenges, both for students and educators. And, and we certainly have seen this um, you know, day in and day out. You know, how are students supposed to process all this information that they receive from this dif different sources, some reliable, some not? What is the responsibility for educators who are helping them process that information? Um, if teachers discuss issues surrounding race and diversity, are they being responsible educators who are helping students digest pressing issues of the day, or are they espousing political views? Um, when they place a pride flag on their desk, or, uh, is that about being inclusive or is that about um, preaching a particular uh, social agenda? These are all difficult questions that educators are now facing as schools become in many ways battlegrounds on which larger cultural issues are being played out. That is why this conference is so important um, to bring educators and all of you together to collaborate on best approaches for confronting these issues and many more that are facing the education system. Um, I know it's not easy work, but I applaud everybody who, who is here and who's working towards that. Um, so, so I guess the question becomes, why am I here? Um, you know, I'm not a teacher. Um, I'm obviously, um, an alumni, um, but I've spent most of my career as a prosecutor in the courtroom. Um, but I, I think that when I consider what, you know, what we're doing, I think it is important and relevant. So for the past six years, I've had the honor to be at the Attorney General's office. I was asked by now Governor Shapiro um, to be his first deputy when he was sworn in. And I was in that role for the past six years and then recently um, became the attorney general. And um, I bring that passion of, of helping children and, and looking out for children with me to this office. And um, as was mentioned, when I was um, in the district attorney's office, I spent a great deal of my time in my career uh, prosecuting child abuse cases. And you know, as, as I'm now in the Attorney General's office, we have worked really hard and recognized that we need to do more to advocate for children. We need to do um, additional and diverse ways to look at how we can help children. You know, obviously we can't go in the classroom and solve all these challenges, um, but I do think that there's um, ways that we can, we can do different things to support um, children and the work that's being done inside the, the schools. Um, and I just want to mention a couple of things in particular that, that we work on here at the Office of Attorney General. Uh, one is we started a program a few years back. Uh, it's a safe to say is what it's called. And what that is, is it allows um, students throughout the Commonwealth 
um, children, um, teachers um, to uh, reach out anonymously, either through a hotline or, or a app on their phone and report anonymously. And, and originally it, it, it was set up to um, allow children to reach out and, and share a tip regarding potential school violence at schools. Um, the truth is it expanded. And what we found is uh, a lot of the tips that came in not only um, dealt with school violence, but they also dealt with um, children that were struggling with mental health. So tips would come in regarding a, a student that was concerned about their best friend and their mental health or concerned about their best friend and something that was happening at their house. And so um, since we started that, there's been um, over 109,000 tips. And um, just this year, we have an increase of 250% of, of the tips that come have come in. And, and we've recovered 25 weapons as a result of this. And what happens is the way the Office of Attorney General is involved is we have trained um, individuals who man that um, tip line 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So those tips come into the Office of Attorney General and we then, our, our team then um, gets them out to the local community, either to the school, to the police department in an effort to um, address a, what, what the tip is about. And that's really become um, an important tool. The other thing that has happened um, and that we've really been looking at, as I've mentioned, is the, um, the uh, concern of, of how social media is impacting um, our children and um, the health, the mental health of young people. Um, certainly on the rise has been mental health issues and students and children that are grappling with that. And um, studies have shown, countless studies have shown that um, social media impacts children um, in a negative way with depression, with anxiety, um, with suicide. And so we are in the process of looking at that issue at the Pennsylvania Attorney General's office. And um, we're collaborating with AG's offices throughout the country. Um, and we're looking at the social media companies and these platforms and how they have fueled this and how they have targeted children in a negative way. Um, and, and looking at ways that we can change the conduct um, and hold them responsible. Um, another area that we think is really important is, is trying to combat the gun violence. And the reality is we can't take the guns out of out of everybody's hands but we've worked very hard and we have a gun violence task force and what we try to do is um, go after the people that um, get the guns in the hands of individuals who can't legally possess them so we call those straw purchasers individuals who are legally allowed to to purchase a gun but then turn it over to somebody that is prohibited by law um, usually because of a criminal conviction. And those guns often turn up in, in crime scenes. And so in an attempt to, to lessen that, we've targeted uh, those individuals who are really purchasing these guns just to make some money and to get them um, into individuals' hands that can't. And what we've seen is that it often is young people, um, 16 and 17 year olds, Olds who have a reality or knowledge, the adults that are that are the criminal adults that are asking them to do this, realizing that they're going to stay in the juvenile justice system. And so they have them um, be, purchase these guns. They have them use the guns um, in, in different crime um, situations. And so we've done our best to really try to keep the hands, uh, the guns out of the, these people's hands. Um, the truth is we're never going to be able to get them all out. But I Think that with each case we do, um, we we take the guns out and we can help save people's lives. And so, give me one minute. Um, and so, that's just some examples of the work that we're doing at the AG's office to to address what we can and to support the educators and the issues that we're seeing, whether it's gun violence, whether it's bullying online. Um, and um, 
I'm committed to really using the power and the resources of the AG's office uh, to protect our kids from the many threats that they face in and out of school. Um, my passion has always been to ensure that kids are given the opportunity to thrive. Um, you know, our young, our young children deserve to, to learn and explore and grow up with some of the comfort and peace of mind that I had um, in Greensburg, Pennsylvania. When I think back to my school age years, I really recognize how lucky I am. I had great friends. As I said, they're still my, my uh, best friends. I had teachers that were amazing who inspired me to go to college. Um, I had law school professors that, that were fantastic at Widener. Um, and the truth is I felt safe and I never worried about being assaulted or shot at. I had access to the resources I needed to get a great education. And I am not advocating that we go backwards, um, even if we could, which we can't. Um, we have advanced too far in terms of technology and inclusion um, to believe that we were better off 30 years ago, but we have to grapple with the legal complications that have arisen in a more technologically advanced and connected and inclusive world. Um, we cannot neglect the fundamental challenges of providing students with a school environment in which they are safe from harm, both physical and mental. Um, that priority is not new, but how we approach it is. Um, and look, I have to say, and this is this is where if my team was here, they would say, don't talk about this, Michelle, you're off topic. But I, I would be, I feel like I would be um, a, a huge component of the cases that I described. So when you think about the case involving the, um, the 14 year old girl and the 41 year old man um, or, or the text scene and the suicide. The truth is we also know that this technology helps us. It helps us hold individuals accountable. And um, I don't know if any of you um, followed or watched uh, the recent trial that got a ton of publicity, the Mur I think the Murtaugh trial in South Carolina. Um, I probably tuned into that more, far more than I should have. Um, but one of the things that, that, that I thought about a lot, that was a case where, um, in case you've been living under a rock and missed it, that was the case where um, a husband who was a very prominent uh, in the community and actually his whole family was um, prominent lawyers in the community was accused of killing his wife and his teenage son. And um, the case went to trial. And, and I thought a lot about that case and I'm not so sure that without technology, they would have got the result that they had. And one of the, the key parts of that, as I think about that case, was simply that, um, you know, the defendant's story, the, the, the mother um, and the son were found uh, a short distance from the home in a, in a building. And the defendant's story was, I wasn't there. Um, they had a very tight timeline for when the shooting happened. And he claimed that he was not there. Um, and one of the critical pieces of evidence for the prosecution was the fact that the teenage son was there and he took a took a picture or a short video and put it up, I think, on Instagram and posted it and had the time. And um, in the background, you could hear the defendant's voice. And that is how they were able to place him at that time and at that scene. And it was such a significant piece of information as well as the technology they were able to obtain about from his car, about the time that the car door was opened and shut and moving around. So I just wanna say that this technology has changed the way we um, investigate these cases and, and, and look at these cases, but there's more to do. Um, we have to be vigilant uh, with children. Um, and um, I am sure that, that the work that all of you will do today, the discussions that you will have um, will, will help move the ball along um, and um, will hopefully be interesting, enlightening, and undoubtedly important. So um, just being here today, you've already demonstrated your commitment to improving the lives of students. Um, as Attorney General, I share in that commitment and I am honored to be in part of this important work. So I applaud your efforts. And again, thank you so much um, for having me here today. I appreciate it. Thank you so much, Attorney General. Thank you very much for coming. Um, we're running a little bit early. So uh, the panel, the next panel will start at 945. So it would be okay just to go ahead and take 10 minute break and be back at 945.
And again, thank you so much, Attorney General. Welcome back, everyone. Um, it's 9.45, and we'll have our first panel. The first panel um, is going to be talking about LGBTQ a plus um, issues in education, and it is moderated by the professor um, of Weiner Law Commonwealth, Professor Jurgen. Well, hello everyone. Good morning. Um, so today we're going to be talking about an issue that is um, obviously top of a lot of people's minds, getting a lot of attention right now. But the um, experience of LGBTQ students in education, um, how states are stepping in to regulate that experience. Um, and we have an excellent group of panelists, um, including Matthew Green, Associate Professor of Law at the CSU College of Law, Jeffrey Dodge, the Associate Dean and Assistant Professor of Law at Penn State Dickinson Law, and Richard Ting, a staff attorney with the ACLU of Pennsylvania. Um, so with that in mind, uh, Matt, feel free to, to get started. Okay, good morning, everyone. Thank you for having me and thank you, Quinn, for that introduction. Um, so there is uh, no shortage of issues to talk about in, in this regard, but I'll focus my uh, discussion on policies um, that prohibit transgender students from using the restrooms, the bathrooms that align with their uh, gender identity. And my talk, among other things, will focus on the harms that these trans exclusionary bathroom policies inflict upon uh, students. Um, these policies have been challenged in a number of ways under Title IX of the Education Amendments Act of 1972, which is what I'll focus on, as well as the Equal Protection Clause. Um, and I think that with regard to Title IX, the issue of injury or harm is, is what I'll focus on. And I think it'll play a significant role going forward uh, in permitting trans students to live consistent with their gender identity in the face of some of these uh, sex segregated policies like bathrooms, uh, dress codes, et cetera. So let's see. Uh, let's see. Can everyone see my screen? All right. So Title IX is a federal statute that says that no person shall, on the basis of sex, be excluded in participation or under be subject to discrimination under any education program or activity that receives federal financial assistance and restrooms have been considered to be part of an, uh, edu an institution's education program. So issues that arise with regard to sex-based restroom policies fall within the scope of the statute. And there's actually now a circuit split on this issue with respect to whether these policies violate the rights of trans individuals, um, either under Title IX or the Constitution. Um, Title IX does not explicitly uh, mention transgender uh, status or gender identity or sexual orientation for that reason, for that matter. But arguments in favor of protecting trans individuals under Title IX received a boost a couple of years ago when the Supreme Court handed down Bostick v. Clayton County, which is with a case that some of you may be familiar with. Um, in Bostick, the court held that discrimination on the basis of gender identity or, or being gay was tantamount to uh, sex discrimination because it inherently involves sex-based decisions. That case arose under Title VII of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, which is an employment discrimination statute, which is what I, I usually write on. Um, and while we are dealing with separate statutes, Title IX on the one hand, which deals with education and, and students, and Title VII and, and employment, um, interpretations of Title VII are often used to guide interpretations of Title IX. Nine. In fact, even before Bostock, some trans individuals had relied on uh, a theory of sex stereotyping to uh, um, uh, assert discrimination under Title IX. Uh, in other words, they, they were discriminated against because they failed to conform with gender norms. And that theory was adopted from cases that arose under, under Title VII. So if discrimination on the basis of being trans violates Title VII, 
seven, it should also fall within the scope of Title IX. And many courts, and more recently, the Biden administration, have um, have adopted that view. So I'll talk a little bit about Bostick and how I think it applies to Title IX. So Bostick was a consolidated case involving two gay men and a trans plaintiff um, who were all fired for being gay. And again, the court held that prescriptions uh, against sex discrimination extended to discrimination on the basis of being gay or transgender. Often you hear sexual orientation, but the court somewhat was narrower, it, it talked about being gay, not necessarily sexual orientation writ large. But briefly, the rationale was that when an employer fires an individual for being gay or trans, it fires that person for traits that would otherwise have tolerated had their sex been different. So, um, so for instance, if it fires an individual who's assigned a female sex at birth, but who now identifies as male, so a trans man, um, employer violate Title VII if it would have treated differently an individual who is assigned female sex at birth, uh, um, but is, uh, or male sex at birth, but is now uh, identifies as man, male. In both cases, but for the individual's birth assigned sex, the individual would have been treated differently. And in the Title IX context, although I think Bostock is helpful, I think it is helpful in determining whether disparate treatment on the basis of being transgender is tantamount to discrimination because of sex. The issue in these bathroom cases raise a slightly different issue than the issue in uh, uh, Bostock. Um, the issue here is whether these uh, trans bathroom policies, I think, and the way I would frame it is whether they cause the individual harm, right? Discrimination in the context of Title VII or Title IX often refer to distinctions or differences in treatment that injure a protected individual. And when a school or an employer segregates the sexes, only men can use the men's room and women can use the uh, uh, women's room, that policy on its face is treating individuals differently because of sex. The issue to be decided, I think here, is whether segregating, segregating the sexes in this matter constitutes unlawful discrimination. It certainly constitutes disparate treatment, but does that rise to the level of, of discrimination? Um, you know, in terms of, of these policies, I think one important point here is that the trans individuals who are challenging these policies, they're not challenging the right of institutions to maintain sex segregated facilities. In fact, you could argue that their the theory of their case kind of hinges on it. And in fact, Title IX by the statute allows for institutions to maintain sex segregated living facilities. And as we see here, the regulations allow for separate toilets, locker room and, and shower facilities. Um, what the plaintiffs argue is not that maintaining sex segregated facilities violates the statute, but that uh, uh, prohibiting them from using the restroom that, that aligns with their gender identity is what is unlawful. Right, right. And, and so I think there are a couple of ways to address that issue with respect to whether, in fact, imposing those sex segregated policies on trans individuals violate Title IX. I think there are a couple of ways to address that. One is to engage in the inquiry of what is sex. Right. Um, that's one way to do it, because if sex is determined by reference to one's gender identity, and for instance, an individual who identifies as a man, Right, like a, a trans man, uh, if, if sex is determined by considering gender identity and the institution is saying men can use, men must use or can use the uh, men's restroom, then that trans man should be able to use the men's room. And, and some courts have handled the issue in, in this manner. And that issue of what do we mean by the word sex has become extremely important in these issues with respect to transgender rights. Uh, the Boston case raised this issue, what does sex mean for purposes of Title VII, but the court didn't resolve it. Um, it. It adopted the position advanced by the employers and the Trump administration at the time that sex refers just to biological distinctions between men and women, essentially birth assigned sex. Um, by contrast, the plaintiffs in that case argued that even in 1964, if we look at sort of the plain public meaning, Right of the word sex, even at that time, it it it, it took on a broader scope, other than just anatomy and chromosomes, but also uh, um, focused on the sex-based norms 
But the plaintiff said, look, even if we use the more narrower position, the more narrow definition, we still win. And in fact, they did uh, uh, under the statute, right? So one way to handle this is to uh, engage in our inquiry, what do we mean when we say sex? But another, and, and sort of what I, what I focus on is to resolve this issue, is through this issue of injury or harm. And that issue also came up in Bostick. So in oral argument, plaintiff's counsel was asked, what happens if we hold that Title VII encompasses claims based on gender identity? If we're defining sex to mean uh, sex assigned at birth and say that it's discrimination could forbid any individual who's assigned a male sex at birth like a trans woman from using the bathroom designated for women, does that mean the end of sex segregated facilities? In short, does holding in favor of the trans plaintiff mean that going forward, anyone who's assigned a male sex at birth should be able to use the women's room and vice versa, anyone who's assigned a female sex at birth should be able to use the, uh, 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 the men's room, right? Then the response was no, it doesn't. Right, it does not. It doesn't spell the end to sex segregated bathrooms, because merely making a sex based distinction doesn't make that distinction discriminatory in the context of anti discrimination law. And going back again, discrimination arises when those distinctions cause injury or harm. Um, so many, many sex-based distinctions are fairly innocuous to, to most people. So for most people, and this also came up on an argument, if you if you go into court and the judge calls a man Mr. and refers to a woman as Ms., that's certainly a sex-based distinction, but it doesn't inflict injury or harm on anyone. Um, and, and Likewise, while most people aren't harmed by requiring them to use the bathroom that aligns with their birth assigned sex, that may fall more harshly or differently on trans individuals. Forcing a trans individual to comply with sex-based rules inconsistent with their gender and identity might indeed cause more than de minimis harm. It might in fact cause significant harm. And to that end, is a transgender person is an individual that has a gender identity that doesn't align with their sex assigned at birth. And some trans individuals are diagnosed with a condition called gender dysphoria, which was the case of Amy Stevens, the trans plaintiff in Bostock, and has been the case in many of these cases that have arisen under Title IX in these school bathroom cases. And gender dysphoria is characterized by clinically significant distress and anxiety resulting from the incongruence between one's individual, an individual's gender identity and birth assigned sex. And if left untreated, it can result in a number of, of uh, uh, um, uh, uh, results. It can result in a number of issues like distress, depression, even things like suicidal ideation. And one of the treatments for gender dysphoria is social transition. So allowing the individual to live fully and consistently with that person's gender identity and, and allowing them to um, uh, live publicly and, and with their gender and all the way that signal gender. So, for instance, the way they dress, the pronouns they use, bathrooms that they're allowed to um, uh, uh, access. So a trans woman or a trans man would suffer and may suffer harm that objectively differs in degree and kind from the harm suffered by most uh, non-transgender transgender employees when forced to comply with these sex separated, uh, uh, sex segregated facilities like bathrooms, et cetera. So this may be another way to maintain these sex segregated facilities, but also permit the trans individual to use the facilities consistent with their gender identity because of the harm that those distinctions um, uh, will will inflict on trans individuals. And I'll wrap up by just saying that I think this may be the approach taken by uh, uh, the Biden administration. So last year during the 50th anniversary of Title IX, the Biden administration issued a, issued a notice of proposed rulemaking that uh, for the first time will do a number of things, including clarifying that the scope of um, uh, 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 yeah, that discrimination on the basis of sex will include discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation and gender identity. Title IX's regulations had never uh, uh, said that explicitly in the past, even though certain administrations like the Obama administration uh, um, stated, stated in much of policy guidance. 
But what the regulations will also say is that in the limited circumstances in which Title IX or the regs allow for different treatment or separation on the basis of sex, a recipient must not carry out that different treatment or separation in a manner that discriminates on the basis of sex by subjecting the person to more than de minimis harm. And if we do not to the last sentence, adopting a policy or engaging in a practice that prevents a person from participating in an education program activity consistent with that person's gender identity subjects that person to more than de minimis harm. So even if the statute or the regs allow the sex uh, uh, separate or sex, sex segregated policy. Policy. You can't do that. You can't apply that policy to individuals if it causes that individual more than de minimis harm, which, according to I think the way the regulations uh, uh, will pan out, um, would apply with respect to these bathroom policies. The the uh, uh, regulations, new regulations, are due out in, in May, I believe, but we don't know when they're going to become effective. Nevertheless, I think this is one way to handle this, this issue of harm. And I'll just uh, end there. All right. Well, thank you very much. Um, we'll now turn to uh, Jeffrey Dodge for a similar issue in the context of trans athletes and some of the regulations that um, states have been adopting in that respect. Um, so Jeff, I'll, I'll turn it over to you. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Uh, good morning, and thank you all, first and foremost, uh, for inviting me to participate in this Widener University Commonwealth Law Review Symposium. I was quite honored when you reached out. Um, I'm really especially grateful to be able to participate in the conversations today around um, issues impacting the LGBTQIA plus community, our allies, and our very existence in society. Um, it is an especially fitting panel and topic today, uh, being International Transgender Day of Visibility a day dedicated to celebrating transgender people and raising awareness of discrimination faced by transgender people worldwide. My remarks this morning are on the discussions around transgender athletes participating in high school athletics. The plan is to start with a review of where we stand on these issues here in Pennsylvania, then take a brief view from a federal perspective, uh, and finally look at other state approaches that are more inclusive. Pennsylvania is one of three states that does not offer guidance from either their state athletic association or legislation slash executive orders uh, on the inclusion of transgender and non-binary students. The extent to which any guidance is offered at all comes from a single sentence uh, in the um, policies and procedures manual of the Pennsylvania Interscholastic Athletic Association. Uh, and it says, quote, where a student's gender is questioned or uncertain, the decision of the principal as to the student's gender will be accepted by the association. I emphasize the term questioned or uncertain because I'm not sure that's exactly how a transgender individual would describe themselves. What's interesting about this is that it doesn't even encourage district-wide decision-making on trans student participation. So hypothetically, because this leaves it to the principals, hypothetically in a school district with more than one high school, one principal in one high school could come to a completely different conclusion on trans student participation than another principal at a high school in the exact same school district. Uh, I'll note that some school districts have adopted policies to offer further context and definition for how this should work. Um, in 2016, it was a big year, a number of school districts um, adopted policies. Great Valley School District in Chester County, for example, adopted a policy permitting, quote, transgender and non-conforming students to participate in athletic programs and opportunities and physical education classes in a manner that is consistent with their consistently asserted gender identity. The next clause of their policy goes on to say a student may seek review of their eligibility for participation in interscholastic athletics by working with the Pennsylvania Inter Interscholastic Activities Association the same one that defaults to the principals. I think this is interesting because it seems like that association really doesn't want ha to have anything to do with it. Uh, and there's no process for reviewing eligibility regarding gendered teams, except to say again that it's up to the principal. Also in 2016, actually the very next day, Springfield Township School District in Montgomery County 
adopted a policy providing that, quote, transgender and gender nonconforming students shall be permitted to participate in interscholastic athletics in a manner consistent with their gender identity and in compliance with the applicable regulations of the Pennsylvania Interscholastic Athletic Association. Uh, it's curious to know, again, that they were one day apart, kind of wonder what was brewing that led to that. Later in 2016, uh, Lower uh, Marion School District adopted a policy uh, about this issue, Philadelphia School Districts, Pittsburgh School Districts. So 2016 was a big year in terms of defining that principal level of discretion. Last year, though, the legislature attempted to weigh in. Last year, Pennsylvania had another major development in this area, actually led by my representative here in Cumberland County, Barbara Gleim, um, who introduced and sponsored a House Bill 972, also known as, and many of you in this virtual room might be familiar with this term, uh, known as the Protect Women Sports Act. Um, that is a common title used by legislatures around the country as a way to bar transgender high school athletes from participating in athletic competitions. A version of that bill passed both the House and the Senate, and again sought to restrict participants to male or female teams based solely on their reproductive organs, biology, or genetics at birth. Under the bill, an athletic team or sport designated for females, women, or girls may not be open to students of the male sex. In addition, a student deprived of an athletic opportunity or who suffers direct or indirect harm as a result of a violation of this act by a college or public school would be able to actually bring a cause of action for injunctive relief, psychological and physical damage, and the cost involved with filing the lawsuit. So you are hearing that it would have created a private cause of action for perhaps a cisgender girl who feels like they have been limited in their access to athletic opportunities by participation of a transgender woman. The bill was wildly known to have no chance of becoming law because at the time uh, we had a Democratic governor, Tom Wolf, who had actually vocalized that he intended to veto it. And when the House and the, and the Senate passed this bill, he did veto it. And he said at the time, amongst other things, but this is a snapshot, this discriminatory legislation would prohibit transgender girls and women from participating on women's athletic teams or sports. The bill denies opportunities to transgender youth, which would have a devastating impact on a vulnerable population already at great risk of bullying and depression. He went on to explain other reasons for the veto but that ended that bill that was just last summer here in Pennsylvania. Let's now take a step back and look at a federal level, picking up on my colleague on the panel here, looking at Title IX. On the federal level, the Biden administration is expected to re release Title IX regulations this May, but it is worth noting that the Biden administration will also engage in the rulemaking process specifically on issues related to transgender high school athletics. So while new rules are anticipated, they will not be comprehensively addressing this issue. The Department of Education uh, has been engaged in the formal rulemaking process though, since taking office with the intention of overturning or at a minimum modifying previous regulations adopted by the Trump administration. The proposed regulations would address a whole range of things, including a discrimination on sexual orientation, gender identity, and sex characteristics. Of note that I think is closest to this particular issue is that it's going to prohibit recipients of federal funds from separating or treating any person differently based on sex in a manner that subjects that person to more than minimal harm, unless it is otherwise permitted under Title IX. This includes policies, practices that prevent a student from participating in a recipient's education program or an activity like athletics consistent with their gender identity. Um, this rule again, you know, is, is one that will have greater context when the Biden administration engages in more active rulemaking rule processes around transgender student athletes. But this is getting us closer. It is important to note that in addition to what we expect in May, we also have um, an executive order that tells us, gives us a glimmer of what's to come. 
Uh, Biden issued on January 20, uh, 2021, an executive order called the Preventing and Combating Discrimination on the Basis of Gender Identity or Sexual Orientation. Um, and in it, it said that, quote, children should be able to learn without worrying about whether they will be denied access to the restroom, the locker room, or school sports. Pending rulemaking processes, though, haven't stopped federal courts from needing to weigh in on the applicability of Title IX. Uh, the second U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals in December 2022 actually upheld a Connecticut policy allowing transgender athletes to play on teams aligned with their gender identities, setting up a possible U.S. Supreme Court showdown on the question of Title IX applicability. The plaintiffs are families of four cisgender female students, high school athletes, who sued the Connecticut Association of Schools, the Connecticut Athletic Conference, multiple school boards, and two transgender students themselves, claiming that the transgender students are, quote, displacing girls through an alleged competitive advantage. If this is successfully appealed and moves to the Supreme Court, it has the possibility to set a Title IX policy on transgender rights that would be much more difficult to walk back from than the revolving doors of regulations issued through the US Department of Education. There is some consequence and timeliness to the Biden administration addressing this. I wanna take now just a, a few seconds to look at more affirming approaches that might be inspiration for the Biden administration's eventual rulemaking on this matter. While 19 states have adopted laws that bar transgender student athletes from competing on sports teams, since 2020, and it's only 2023, 19 states, some of these laws are not actually being enforced because there's pending litigation before the courts. Like the attempted effort here in Pennsylvania, many of these laws were adopted under the guise of, quote, protecting fairness in women's sports. This focus is intentional as it attempts to pit, and as that lawsuit indicates, it does pit cisgender women, cisgender girls against transgender women and girls. A competition not on the field for athletic ability, but for resources, access, and achievement in sports more broadly. This positioning to legislate also completely ignores transgender male athletes. Remember that we're not just talking about transgender women when we're talking about athletics, restrooms, and other issues. There are other transgender identities. And yet all of these laws are really hyper-focused on women, women's sports, girls' sports. This, in my mind, really reinforces the broader legislati legislative agenda of governing women, their bodies, and their opportunities with no political rhetoric, concern, or laws restricting men similarly. In short, this is a contemporary issue being legislated and litigated right now. Rather than focusing on the bars and the bans, these lawsuits any further, I'll offer just a quick quick review of, of some states that have some more affirming approaches. California, no surprise, far from here, um, their policies through the California Interscholastic Federation and through an actual law passed in 2014 state that all students should have the opportunity to participate in interscholastic activities in a manner that is consistent with their gender identity, irrespective of the gender listed on a student's record. They can even request an eligibility hearing when they can have that review and actually discuss with uh, officers uh, that are trained to understand um, you know, how to determine one's gender identity for purposes of athletics. The law it sa itself says, quote, a pupil shall be permitted to participate in sex segregated school programs and activities, including athletic teams and competitions and use facilities consistent with his or her gender identity irrespective of the gender listed on the pupil's record. I put a little emphasis on the his or her because I think this indicates that even in a state like California, we have some room to grow and we have some room to improve because even in the law that is meant to provide some protections and opportunities for transgender individuals, we are reinforcing binary gender norms with pronouns like his or her codified into the statute. 
In Massachusetts, there is a law to, that says uh, to establish that no person shall be excluded or discriminated against in admission to public school of any town or obtaining the advantages, privileges, and courses of study of such public school on account of their gender identity, among other characteristics. The responsibility for determining a student's gender identity rests with the student themselves, or in the case of young students not yet able to advocate for themselves with the parent. This is different than some of the other examples which left the authority in a, a potential board, left it with a principal, a school district. This is about the student themselves. A school is required under the law to accept a student's assertion of their gender identity when it is, quote, consistent and uniform assertion of the gender identity, gender related identity, or any other evidence that the gender related identity is sincerely held as part of that person's core identity. Confirmation of a student's asserted gender identity may include a letter from a parent, healthcare provider, school staff, or others to show it is consistent in their gender identity and expression. In Utah, some of you in the room might be wondering, why is he talking about Utah? Utah is always an interesting place when it comes to LGBTQI uh, issues. A very red and deeply conservative state, it also though has tried to sought to find and has successfully found some ways to collaborate in compassionate ways around LGBTQIA issues. It is interesting, it did also pass, like the Pennsylvania law here and the 19 other states, it did pass a bill that banned transgender students from participating in school sports consistent with their gender identity. Members of both parties though felt it was hastily pushed through the Senate and heavily amended it on the last night of Utah's legislative session. With leadership in both houses, from both parties deciding to vote against it or not vote at all, the bill made its way to a Republican governor in Utah, Spencer Cox, for signing, and he decided to veto it instead. In a letter explaining that veto, Governor Cox cited high suicide rates among transgender youth and added that there are only four transgender students playing high school sports in Utah and only one playing girls sports. The letter outlined Utah's past attempts at co compassionate and collaborative solutions and encouraged the legislature to engage in the same types of processes. Unfortunately, the House and the Senate voted to overrule that veto and the law went into effect. But a judge later, just this last fall, issued a preliminary injunction calling it, quote, plainly unfavorable treatment of transgender girls. Anticipating the possibility of legal challenges to the ban, the law actually had written into it by the state legislature a stipulation that created if an injunction, if a stay on the law was put into place, a commission will decide which transgender athletes can and cannot participate in sports based on factors such as a player's wingspan, weight, height, and more. It is worth noting that the Utah High School Activities Association already had guidance available to schools and districts before the legislature chose to enter the conversation. That guidance created a number of factors and circumstances by which to help schools and school districts evaluate these circumstances. I'll conclude my remarks though by bringing it back here to Pennsylvania. This week, my colleague, who leads our Anti-Racist Development Institute, Tawanda Hunter-Stallworth. She and I just kind of coincidentally, I think, in somehow karmically we're supposed to coincide in our thinking and our talks. Earlier this week, she said, I have to give a talk on empathy. And empathy has been on my mind heavily as I prepare for these remarks and other things. I teach an ed law class this semester and I've been thinking about ways to introduce this topic near the end of the semester. Why? Well, here in Cumberland County, minutes away from this law school and Widener Commonwealth, at the end of February, a lawsuit uh, was filed against West Shore School District's social emotional learning curriculum. It was filed in federal court. The four parents who filed suit against the district with the help of America First Legal Foundation and Moms for Liberty 
claim that the curriculum conflicts with their religious values. At issue in the lawsuit is the district's character strong curriculum. According to the district, the program was designed to help our children learn the value of empathy, service, and connection. The parents, however, argued that the curriculum violates their religious beliefs. Intrigued, I explored the topic further and found emails attached to the lawsuit, including one from a parent who requested that the district exempt her five children from the program. The mother wrote that it does not reflect her religious beliefs, saying, quote, our belief is that there are only two genders, she wrote in one email that she attached as evidence, adding that her family was pro-life. She also then went on to say, not every human is deserving of my child's empathy. I wanna read that again. Not every human is deserving of my child's empathy. The culture wars in our education system are now moving to attack the human feeling of empathy, a cornerstone of inclusion, a foundation for educational equity a basic expectation of civil and political disagreement, a necessity to appreciate human rights, human lives, the way we coexist, the concerns around transgender athletes participating in high school athletics may feel like a niche issue, but it encapsulates the full range of attacks on people of minoritized identities and represents a bullying of some of the smallest, most marginalized communities in our country, in our homes, in our home states. These students' right to equitably access the opportunities available through their education are part of an intentional attack on people and views that are different from their own, an attack more broadly on the human emotion of empathy. Thank you. Thank you very much. Moving on to uh, Rich Ting, we'll be talking um, about a lot of these issues, but from an on the ground perspective, um, focusing some of the litigation that the ACLU is participating in, as well as some issues here in Pennsylvania. Um, so Rich, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, good morning, and thanks for having me. I'll, I'll be brief, so we still have time for, for Q&A. Uh, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about kind of what we're seeing at the local level and some of the work that we're doing here at the ACLUPA. So, and also I wanna talk a little bit about, uh, so what <laughs> professors Green and Dodge talked about these specific policies, so bathroom policies and athletics policies and uh, you know how that may play into uh, a legal theory of a hostile environment for LGBTQ kids. So you know, as Professor Green and Professor Dodge kind of alluded to, there is some uncertainty <laughs> in the law, whether those individual policies by themselves are illegal under Title IX, that's still being litigated in the courts. Uh, but one theory that we're kind of pursuing here is that you know those types of policies in conjunction with a lot of other things that are happening in the schools are creating or exacerbating a hostile environment for LGBTQ kids. And a hostile environment is one form of recognized discrimination under Title IX, and most of the case law is actually in the employment context, so Title VII cases, and as Professor Green said, Title VII cases, though, do provide a lot of guidance for Title IX cases, so typical employment scenario would be the you know, employee is being subjected to persistent sexual harassment uh, by coworkers, the employer knows about it, the employer does not take reasonable measures to address it, so Kind of translating that to the K through 12 education environment, that would be uh, similar to, you know, uh, say a trans student is subjected to a lot of bullying and harassment by other students. Uh, the student and their family, they report it to the school district. The administration either doesn't do anything about it or doesn't take reasonable measures to address it. Or unfortunately, what we're seeing is these school districts are actually adopting policies and taking actions that are actually making the environment worse. Uh, so that's what we're seeing. Uh, so specifically in Central Buck School District, some of you may have heard we filed a, an OCR complaint. So that's the Office for Civil Rights of the U.S. Department of Education. We filed an administrative complaint with them in October against the Central Buck School District on behalf of seven students who are uh, either trans or non-binary, who all experience some form of 
uh, bullying and harassment by other students and you know reported it to the school and the school district did not do anything to really address it. The bullying and harassment persists. And not only that, but the, the school board has been adopting policies targeting the LGBTQ community. So examples, uh, they recently adopted a policy regulating what teachers are allowed to display in the classrooms and what they're allowed to talk about in the classrooms. And you know, in public statements, the board president said that, you know, that was targeted towards pride flags in particular. Uh, it also says it's this vague policy that bans discussion of its partisan, political, or social policy matters, whatever social policy matter might mean. Uh, so there's that. They, there are also kind of directives from administration that were not official policies. So there were some directives saying, for example, uh, you cannot honor a request to use different pronouns or a name different from what's in the school system unless you get parental permission first. And any student that requests that has to be referred to the guidance counselor. Uh, so things like that as well. Uh, so you know all those things together uh, are legal theories that you know that is creating or exacerbating a, a hostile environment for LGBTQ kids. Another thing that we're seeing a lot around the state are uh, library book uh, removals or book bans. I know on the other side they they like to say it's not really a ban, but whatever you want to call it, it's you know targeting books in the libraries and getting them out of the libraries. And a lot of those. Kind of book bans are it's pretty clear from public comment and comments of board members are targeted towards lgbtq contents content in the libraries uh so just a few other examples of things we're seeing around the state and then i'll wrap up so we have time for q a uh so pencrest school district which is in crawford county and benango county that's northwest pa uh there's been a lot going on there one board member i believe at the end of last school year <laughs> publicly stated that a, a high school library pride display was totally evil and should not be in the schools. Uh, they refused the high school uh, Gay Straight Alliance uh, invitation to a, a trans candidate who was running for PA State Senate. Uh, they invited her to come speak as a guest speaker to their student club and the board prohibited that from happening. Uh, the one board member held up a purchase of library books saying that uh, this is not based on LGBTQ content, but he said that, that they, the books on the list were too focused on racism, and one of the books promoted the hate group Black Lives Matter. Uh, so, and then, so that's happening there. Uh, with respect to the athletics policies, you know, Professor Dodge mentioned 2016 was a great year where we saw a lot of these inclusive policies. Sadly, we're now seeing these exclusive policies pop up uh, over the past school year. So Pencrest has just recently adopted a, a policy that they added, I think, biological at birth or something, some language along those lines. Uh, and also Hempfield School District in Lancaster County, I think, also recently adopted a athletics policy based on sex assigned at birth. Um, so there's that going on. Uh, another school district where it, Things have been having is it's called Southside School District that's in Beaver County, just northwest of Pittsburgh. Uh, they actually had a, an inclusive pronoun uh, policy, and then what happened was a teacher refused to follow it on religious grounds, and then that led to a big public outcry in support of the teacher. The board actually backed down, and now the board has formed an ad hoc committee to discuss the pronoun policies. And the 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 meeting of the ad hoc committee, I think in March, uh, the the agenda was to to present the biblical perspective. And they had two pastors come speak. The agenda list of questions to discuss included things like, "Are all people created equal?" Um, and the last meeting was to present perspective of parents of transgender children. They had parents from outside the district because I think any parents in the district would are afraid to to speak. And some of the questions on the agenda for those parents were, "Do you think your child is a mistake?" So um, these are the types of things we're seeing around the state. Uh, I'll wrap up there so we still have some time for 
for Q and A. Well, thank you so much. Um, this has really been a, a great combination of presentations um, that has really gotten at the, the core of a lot of these issues. Um, I want to focus my, my first question for the panel on uh, what Jeff was saying in his closing remarks and talking about empathy. Um, and I'm curious to, to get the panel's perspective on what role empathy does play as we think about this or basic ideas of fairness as we think about some of these legal issues and what role should empathy and fairness play? Um, I mean, I know in the student loan context, for example, the Supreme Court tells us it's okay to think about uh, fairness uh, arguments. So should we should we take that and run with it? Or what what is the current legal regime and what what should we think about in terms of how to litigate some of these arguments based on fairness and empathy? I guess I can jump in. Uh, that's a really interesting question because I, you know, I think fairness certainly is a, you know, a common legal concept. That's I think that's certainly something that's considered in legal decisions with with empathy. You know, I don't know that that's a, a legal consideration, but it's certainly a, a human consideration for sure. And you know, judges are humans, so you know that that certainly is something that's important, I think. I, I don't know that it's a legal argument to make. It's certainly more important in the policy realm. And a lot of these issues that we're talking about really are more of a political issue than a legal issue. Um, so that's, I think, important to keep in mind as well. Yeah, uh, you know, I also, I, I think I agree. And I just don't see a lot of that uh, empathy. You, you mentioned the student loan issue. And, you know, one of the things that just struck me with that was when um, uh, Biden's plan came down to sort of forgive some of the loans. How many people um, raised the argument, well, what about the people who've already paid off their loan? They're going to be so upset. And I, it's just something I, I just thought was, I just didn't understand the argument. Um, you know, why would you be upset that someone else who has been struggling to pay back their loans for years and years and years um, or may get a reprieve, uh, even though you've been fortunate enough to be able to pay off yours? Like, But this idea of just walking in someone else's shoes, it just seems like we're getting so far removed from that. And, and I think that is also the case from you know, just my personal perspective and what I'm saying with LGBTQ equality as well. Um, you know, I remember back in um, 2016 when the North Carolina bathroom ban came out and there was just this huge outcry um, about the unfairness of it all. And it just seems like we're just so miles away from that now that people, um, you know, they just sort of found their camps and they're in them and and there's, you know, just sort of no walking in anyone else's shoes, no understanding. Um, at least I'm seeing less and less. I don't mean to sound doom and gloom, but I'm seeing less and less of that now. Um, and I don't know how much that plays out in the legal field, but legal sphere, but certainly I think in terms of policy and in terms of, you know, appealing to school boards and legislatures, you know, it just seems like we're getting so far away from those principles. I'll, um, I'm I'll be a tiny bit rambling, but I do have a legal point. Uh, my husband and I have a seven and eight year old, uh, a son and a daughter. Um, we are at a wonderfully antagonistic sibling age where everything is in comparison with one another, with fairness constantly looming as the overarching theme about how we treat them, what we provide them. They're almost act like twins, even though they're a year apart. For those of you that are parents or that have kids, you know, or, or are sibling, you can understand what I'm talking about, right? And when I think about the idea of fairness, which is truly a legal concept, right? Fairness is sort of, is connected to justice, the rule of law, right, in our society. I think about the vast subjectivity of fairness in its application in our legal system. And where does that subjectivity come from? our own lived experiences, the biases we bring to that role in determining what's fair and what's not fair, what we can envision out of circumstances we're asked to assess from a fairness, justice, rule of law standpoint. And that requires empathy. That's a core human emotion that informs how I can determine what is fair or not from a legal standpoint. 
And you know, to, to Professor Green's point, we are getting so far away. And I don't mean to be a big softy, keep emphasizing on the fairness, but you know, I sit in in our little um, you know, extrajudicial court of law in our living room, dealing constantly with these issues of what we permit or allow each of our child to children to do as matters of fairness. And they are constantly drawing upon their lived experiences for the empathy for us to understand the lens of fairness of their argument. And that's that's where I think it plays a role. I don't think it plays a role in a codified law. I don't think it plays a role, you know, actively in ruling, but it it plays a role in how we are developed as humans and how we interact with one another in our society, and then what our legal system reflects about our society. And its deterioration, it's a, the attack on it is going to impact the most marginalized. And after the most marginalized, it will impact increasingly those that are less and less and less till it impacts everybody and the ways in which we interact and evaluate concepts of fairness, justice, rule of law. One, one issue that I think picks up on something that um, Matt had identified um, is that we're increasingly getting into sort of defining what sex is. We're defining what male is. We're defining what female is. Um, and, you know, one thing that I've heard people articulate is that the legislators who are doing this aren't necessarily thinking about the far out consequences of uh, providing some of those definitions. Um, and so I guess, you know, it, it's a relatively open ended question, but what are some of the consequences of defining sex in some of the ways that we are? Um, and I guess a, a specific example is, you know, thinking about some of the, the bathroom bans, for example, that are being passed in states that preempt local ordinances and require gender segregated bathrooms. Um, there's no inclusion of how people who happen to be intersex, for example, would fit into that dichotomy. Um, so what are some of the consequences of defining sex in this way? Well, I guess I'll say, um, so one of the consequences, I think, I think the intent is to um, basically essentially make it based on biological if you will considerations or just birth assigned sex and to um take the opportunity away from uh folks like transgender individuals to use restrooms consistent with their gender identity i'm not even sure the intersex community um is being considered often when we have these discussions. Interestingly enough, you know, I talked about Title IX and so did uh, Professor Dodge a little earlier about um, the Biden administration coming out with regulations. And the, one of the things that, that it's going to do in the proposed uh, regs is to uh, specifically say that sex-based tra traits and characteristics um, uh, to discriminate on that basis, discriminate on the basis of sex, and, and it explicitly mentions intersex population. Um, so in in some ways, I, I guess it'll be covered in that way, um, but uh, with respect to those regulations. But uh, you know, one of the I think the the overarching purpose of of defining sex just to be a reproductive uh, biology for its reproductive capacity, et cetera, is is to limit the rights uh, under these laws. And I think that is what that's what we're seeing and that's that's the whole purpose of it one of the other things I, I think that you know sort of came out in a lot of the the remarks that were being articulated was that a lot of this is based from the standpoint of people who are cis um, in evaluating you know harms that are visited upon them um, and I know for example you know there's there's a piece of legislation currently, um, making its way through the Florida legislature that imposes some of these bathroom bans, but actually makes it a criminal penalty if somebody ineligible to be in the bathroom refuses to leave if asked to do so uh, by somebody lawfully entitled to be there. Um, you know, how, how does that sort of perspective, thinking about this from a cis standpoint rather than from a trans standpoint, I mean, what is there legal significance to that? Um, or is that just sort of reflective of bias that, that may be permissible depending on how courts like the U.S. Supreme Court step into this? I'll, I'll say uh, 
you know, one thing I was really struck with in preparation for this is just is just that a lot of these laws, and we see them in other contexts, right? We see them in contexts where you know state governments or state legislatures have passed laws, and um, they're not able to enforce laws in every doctor's room office, in every household, in every community, because there's not a there's not a police force out looking at these types of issues, right? So they empower and embolden private causes of action, right? And that's what happened in Connecticut. Families of four cisgender girls filed suit because of the alleged harms they felt by two transgender women participating in athletic opportunities, right? By the policies of the state of Connecticut allowing these two transgender girls to participate, they felt there were harms to these four cisgender girls. And I think it's a very dangerous, non-inclusive <laughs> uh, uh, precedent, not just in the transgender athlete space, but in restrooms, in, in other areas outside of education where we are empowering private citizens to take legal action arguably with shaky grounds on the standing side in terms of actual harm or you know actually being the one that's hurt by somebody else to try to enforce or further culture war agendas political agendas through legal action i guess how how you know in, in our final minutes in thinking about this um, where do we go from here? You know, each of you uh, talked in various ways about either lawsuits that are going on or what the Biden administration is planning on doing from a federal standpoint, but what is the way forward? You know, there's lawsuits proceeding in federal court. There's lawsuits proceeding in state court. Um, are state courts better avenues for some of this litigation? Um, should we pin our hopes on uh, whatever rule is articulated by the Biden administration? What, what should we do um, or what is the response perhaps to, to a lot of these issues? I can start. So as I mentioned before, a lot of these issues truly are more political than legal. So, you know, one of the frustrations and limitations of the legal system is it's very reactive, right? You need something bad to happen before you can take action. Uh, so a lot of these things we're seeing in, in Pennsylvania, I think just because of the, the political situation here, uh, a lot of this is happening at the local level. So at the school board level, and hopefully everyone knows school board elections happen in odd years, and that's when voter turnout is very low. So this is an odd year. So if you're a local school board, likely to have uh, open seats up for election. Uh, also very important in Pennsylvania is hopefully everyone knows there is a currently a vacancy on the PA Supreme Court. So that also will be filled by election. So that is something else that's important. It's just making sure you... Uh, vote, <laughs> look into issues that you care about and what candidates' uh, positions are and 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 voting. If I could just feedback on that. Yeah, I, I just had this conversation with someone the other day, the importance of being involved in the political process. I mean, I think we are where we are in many ways because people didn't vote. Um, and the judiciary was just able to be changed dramatically. Um, and whether we like it or not, you know, how these courts interpret some of these laws, laws can say what they want to say, but how they're interpreted by the courts matter a great deal. Um, so I, I just, I, I can't say that enough in terms of what we can do going forward, just be involved um, in, in the local elections and the school board activity, but certainly um, whenever you have the opportunity to vote for candidates and, and, and encourage other people to get involved in the political process, um, because I think that governs a lot of what we're doing, what we're discussing with respect to our legal rights, you know, in terms of the laws that are passed and how they are being interpreted. Um, and not to go back to, to prior conversations, but I will just say something that uh, uh, Professor Jurgen mentioned earlier about the harms, you know, in reading these cases, I, I, you know, I struggle to see what harms are being inflicted upon cisgender people in these sex segregated spaces. I mean, it's it's just sort of 
um, you know, I don't know if their dignity is offended, but in terms of actual harm to privacy or safety, which is what they continue to 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 um, uh, talk about, they're just no, there. There's absolutely no data to back it up um, in terms of any any safety concerns and any sex regulated spaces or any privacy concerns. But that's going back a little bit. But you know, those are, those are my brief comments. Well, yeah, vote, get involved in your political process. Uh, much of education law and policy is, is at the local educational authority level, at the state level. The federal government is just a small part of it, although it comes with funding and can, can influence things in ways that, that make change. But as we've seen, when presidential administration changes, you know, there can be different, very differing viewpoints on what something like Title IX even means and how it is how it is regulated and rolled out and viewed and how compliance is defined. And so, um, you know, not to like leave you with a, a, a note of everything is uncertain, but, you know, on, on the local and state level, you know, I think th those are ways that we can really play active roles in shaping policy. Um, and, you know, remember, uh, I, I'm not going to remember the exact quote, you know, fast enough, but a lot of these issues that we've talked about, these human rights types issues really are so localized, they're literally in your home, in your neighborhood, on your street, how you interact with each other at Widener Commonwealth in the classroom, right? Those moments set a tone, right, for how we treat each other when we leave these spaces and we go into positions of power, when we are judges, attorneys, influencers, policy makers, and it's important to be able to to listen, learn, and grow from, from those exchanges in ways that advance all of our opportunities educationally and beyond. Well, thank you all very much for what was um, at once kind of a, a grim topic of conversation, but also inspiring in terms of thinking about um, what, what possible next steps are, how people are responding to, to stuff like this and so on. Um, and a truly excellent conversation to have on International Transgender Day of Visibility as well. Um, so thank you all very, very much. Um, and I'll, I'll turn it back over to, to Jane. Thank you, Professor Jorgen. Um, thank you for moderating the excellent panel. Thank you, Professor Green, Professor Dodge, and um, Attorney Ting. Um, and if I may, I just really wanted to thank Professor Dodge for bringing empathy into the conversation. I think it gets lost a lot. Um, and just your passion. And from the mom of three, that rivalry between your kids will never end. <laughs> thank you. Um, our next panel is going to be talking about freedom um, of expression in schools. And it is moderated by the Dean of our Widener Law Commonwealth, Dean Hussey. Thank you, Jane. Welcome to all of you. I'm delighted to be able to join you for this panel and to moderate this morning. Um, our second panel is about the freedom of expression in schools. And we have two excellent panelists with us, uh, Dr. Kathleen Kahn and uh, Dean Michael Kaufman. I'll introduce each of them before I turn it over uh, to them for their remarks. Dr. Kathleen Kahn is a member of the Education Law Group at King Spry, and her experience in education includes 18 years of service in public school districts in Pennsylvania as a teacher, as a K-12 curriculum supervisor, and as an elementary school principal. She has also taught full time at Newman University and served as an adjunct professor at Widener University Delaware Law School. She currently teaches public health and the law, a course she developed as an adjunct in the public health program at Muhlenberg College. Dr. Khan has been a consultant to school districts, private schools, and intermediate units on issues of school safety, bullying, cyberbullying, sexual harassment, and special education. She is the past president and executive board member of both the Pennsylvania Science Teachers Association and the Delaware Valley affiliate of the Pennsylvania Association of Supervision and Curriculum Development, and has been awarded that organization's annual research and publication award three times. As a legal scholar, Dr. Khan has published numerous commentaries in peer-reviewed law journals, national and international, on topics of bullying, cyberbullying, sexual harassment, student suicides, and school administrators' responsibilities. She earned her BS in physics from St. John's University in New York, 
her MS in Radiation Biology and Biophysics at the University of California at Los Angeles, and her PhD in Physics and Biology at Bryn Mawr College Graduate School of Arts and Sciences. She is uh, a member of both the Pennsylvania Bar and the United States Supreme Court Bar. Dr. Khan, we welcome you. So glad to have you here. Our second panelist is Dean Michael Kaufman, the Dean of uh, Santa Clara University School of Law. Uh, prior to being Dean at Santa Clara, he was the Dean at Loyola University in Chicago um, and also the Associate Dean uh, for Academic Affairs there as well. While at Loyola, he served as the Acting Provost and Chief Academic Officer, leading the university's academic vision and inclusive strategic planning process. Dean Kaufman founded Loyola's Roden Center for Social Justice, Education Law and Policy Institute, Rule of Law Institute, and the Institute for Investor Protection. He also developed Chicago, uh, Loyola Chicago's innovative and popular hybrid weekend JD program. His research in education, law, policy, equity, and Pedagogy inspired him to found Loyola's Education Law and Policy Institute, which conducts research conferences, comprehensive academic programs, direct representation and advocacy dedicated to enhancing the educational uh, process um, and access and equity in that process. The Institute has developed particular expertise and experience in racial equity, special education, school discipline reform, early childhood education and anti-bullying. Dean Kaufman was elected three times to serve on the Board of Education for a diverse K-12 school district in the Chicago area. As the board's president, he led multiple stakeholders in a community-wide strategic planning process, helped to consolidate and integrate racially segregated neighborhoods in the school district and worked with um, and for the educational best interest of all of the students. After graduation from law school, he had clerked for the Honorable Nathan uh, R. Jones of the United States Court of Appeals for the Sixth Circuit. He earned his BA at Kenyon College and his JD from the University of Michigan. Dean Kaufman, it's a delight to have you here. Thank you. Thank you. Great to see you all. Thank you. Good. Dr. Khan, I'm going to turn it over to you to begin our panel in this discussion. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, I am going to share my screen. Um, here we go. Uh, and I'm going into the slideshow. It always takes a minute or two to get this way. I'm going to be talking about another controversial issue uh, that arises from a Supreme Court decision in 2021, Mahano the Mahanoy case. The Mah Mahanoy decision uh, started out actually in the Middle District of Pennsylvania in 2019, when school officials punished a young woman, B.L. Brandy Levy, for off-campus vulgar speech, which she posted on social media after she failed to make the school's varsity cheerleading team. And the district court ruled for B.L. The Third Circuit Court affirmed, but in doing the affirmation, added a, a small sentence, which people just went crazy about, as a matter of first impression, that Tinker does not apply to off-campus speech. Tinker is the case of the black armbands during the Vietnam War when the students wore the black armbands to school as protected speech expression. And actually, even in the Pennsylvania courts, Tinker has applied to much of off-campus speech. And the Third Circuit also said that the school's punishment of Brandy was excessive and that the team conduct rules didn't operate to waive students' First Amendment rights. So there were, uh, there were many school districts and school district administrators that were very upset about questions for the team conduct rules. And when the Supreme Court finally announced the Mahanoy decision, um, the, the Supreme Court really didn't consider the team conduct rules, but I think that the Supreme Court took this case 
to write the expression about Tinker's application to off-campus speech. Okay, and if you look at the foundational student speech decisions, they're all K to 12 until Mahanoy. Uh, K to 12 on-campus speech until Mahanoy comes along and specifically deals with off-campus speech. And BL and a friend were in the local hangout in Mahanoy City, which is actually not a city, it's a borough with fewer than 5,000 people. It's 38 miles southwest of Wilkes-Barre, the coal country of Pennsylvania, and 77 miles west of Philadelphia. And BL tried out, she was apparently a very good cheerleading um, team member, but she tried out for the varsity cheerleading squad at her high school and for an off-campus softball team. And she made neither one. Uh, and with her friend this weekend in the local hangout, she posted on Snapchat the infamous middle finger gesture. Um, we have a little screenshot here of it, um, accompanied by the caption. Now I'm using F as a signature for the F word, but she actually said F school, F softball, F cheer, F everything. And one of the cheerleading coaches' daughters saw that, and she was disciplined by being put off the cheerleading team for an entire year. And Justice Breyer wrote the opinion of the Supreme Court. And very often, Supreme Court decisions have a lot of wording, um, but we really don't know how to apply them in several in situations. So we look to how the Supreme Court opinion is cited in different court decisions. And Justice Breyer said, three features of off-campus speech distinguish schools' efforts to regulate off-campus speech. And Breyer said, first, a school will rarely stand in loco parentis when a student speaks off-campus. Second, regulations of off-campus speech when coupled with regulations of on-campus speech may mean the student cannot engage in that kind of speech at all. And third, the school itself has an interest in protecting a student's unpopular expression, especially when the expression takes place off-campus because America's public schools are the nurseries of democracy. And Justice Breyer's opinion was clear but wary. Schools may regulate off-campus student speech that constitutes, Breyer said, serious or severe bullying or harassment targeting particular individuals, threats aimed at teachers or other students, the student's failure to follow rules concerning lessons, the writing of papers, the use of computers, or participation in other online school activities, and breaches of school security devices, including material maintained within school computers. These are all very specific things that can be regulated in off-campus student speech, but the wariness comes in because Justice Breyer said, but there may be other kinds of off-campus speech that schools can also regulate. So a little bit of leeway here. Justice Breyer says, well, what about the relevance of the student's age, the nature of the off-campus activity, or the impact on the school itself? And the other considerations about in loco parentis, parents regulating student speech, but not schools, or political or religious speech on or off campus where the First Amendment applies, or unpopular political or religious speech or ideas of students off campus. So we don't really know in all specific situations what is going to happen. Will Tinker apply to off-campus speech? Many courts have cited Mahanoy. Mahanoy was published on June 23rd, 2021, and 78 times it says in this slide, but I checked just yesterday and we're already up two more Two more uh, cases have cited Mahanoy in March, and we're now up to 80 citations. Obviously, I'm not going to go through all 80, but I decided we should look at the various circuit courts of appeals. And there are eight different circuits in K-12 and higher education that have already referenced 
the Mahan Mahanoy decision. And as a matter of fact, I just said June 23rd, the Supreme Court published Mahano the Mahanoy decision. Here it is cited June 29th, not even a week later, in a case from the Fifth Circuit, Oliver versus Arnold. I think this might be a record for citing the Supreme Court decision uh, in six days. But right now there was a disagreement between a teacher who required students to write out the Pledge of Allegiance and a student who refused. And along with her mother, she sued unsuccessfully, alleging a First Amendment violation. And the footnote from Mahanoy was in Alito's concurrence. In a math class, for example, the teacher can insist that students talk about math, not some other subject. So the ruling was for the teacher and um, Oliver, actually the, the, uh, Oliver actually went on and in December um, was, was all, all the rehearings were denied. Okay, so I'm gonna go through the circuits in order. Uh, the first circuit, definitely an on and off campus speech case, Doe v. Hopkinton Public Schools in Connecticut. And there, a younger member of the school hockey team was bullied both on and off campus with students videotaping the young team member without his permission, uh, posting insults to his family on this Snapchat group and excluding him and cyberbullying him at this Snapchat group. And from Mahanoy, the First Circuit said, the school's regulatory interests remain significant in some off-campus circumstances. These include serious or severe bullying or harassment targeting particular individuals. So pulling out that targeting that Justice Breyer mentioned. The Fourth Circuit, in a case, uh, in a Starbuck case. Starbuck is the name of Jonathan Starbuck. He was conversing with a friend at school about the damage the school shooter in the Parkland mass shooting could have done because he was the shooter was in the school for a long time and also had explosives. But a teacher overheard Jonathan and the school suspended him for threats. However, the Fourth Circuit quoted Mahanoy affirming that student on-campus speech is protected unless indecent, lewd, or vulgar, promotes illegal drug use, or is communicated through a school-sponsored activity. But school officials must be able to show that their action was caused by something more than a mere desire to avoid the discomfort and unpleasantness that always accompany an unpopular viewpoint. And the teacher um, had to take back the suspension. The Fourth Circuit also has a very interesting decision in a case Peltier versus Charter Day School. And this Fourth Circuit case is um, about the public charter school named CDS, the Charter Day School. And it's managed by trustees, a board of trustees and a private management company. And they require that girls must wear skirts in school. And here's the quote that is in the Charter Day School uh, publications, girls are fragile vessels who are deserving a gentle treatment by boys. Wow. And Bonnie Peltier and her parents asserted that this is a sex-based classification grounded in gender stereotypes and violates the Equal Protection Clause and Title IX. And country uh, chartered, day, uh, chartered Day School said, oh, no, no, it, we can't be violating a uh, 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 an equal protection clause because we're not state actors, we are private actors. The district court said the CDS did not, did violate the equal protection clause, but not Title IX. And the Fourth Circuit vacated the Title IX claim and remanded it back to district court. And the quote from Mahanoy was that America's public schools are the nurseries of democracy. And interestingly enough, the, the Charter Day School filed a petition for certiorari on September 12th. Now, we don't know whether this, the Supreme Court is going to grant the uh, petition for certiorari, but the court issue, the issue that the court has has um, focused on is to decide whether a private entity that contracts with the state to operate a charter school engages in state action as state actor. 
So that's going to be very important, not only for the Fourth Circuit, but for all of our charter schools in the United States. And here's an unusual application of Mahanoy. It's a child endangerment case from the Fifth Circuit. And here, an officer of, of, of the, uh, the law removed a daughter from her home while the parents were away. The, the father was serving in the military in Afghanistan and the mother had traveled to Afghanistan to see if she could bring her two children there. And the child's, the daughter was found home alone and one of the neighbors uh, called in this child investigation team and Officer Bruner removed the child. The court ruled there was no exigency. The child was well enough to uh, have her own safety, uh, monitored to monitor her own safety. The removal was particularly egregious because they wouldn't let the child talk with her parents, even uh, by phone. And the court ruled that the officer did not have qualified immunity. And again, the court in the Fifth Circuit went back to Justice Alito's concurrence in Mahanoy and said that parents, not the state, have a primary authority and duty to raise, educate, and form the character of their children. So that, again, from Justice Alito's uh, concurrence. Okay, and here is NJ versus Sonnaben from the Seventh Circuit. Now, NJ is not New Jersey. It's the abbreviation of a middle school student, along with AL, a high school student, who both were told they could not wear t-shirts depicting handguns in school. Um, there was not a written policy about handguns. There was a dress code policy about inappropriate attire. And students argued violation of their First Amendment. And here, the court cited Mahanoy four different times and um, talked about Tinker in Mahanoy and other categories, the, the, the line of Justice Breyer, the caution, other categories might emerge on new facts. And then they quoted, Mahanoy had quoted Kuhlmeyer's regulation of school newspaper and talked about regulating school newspapers twice again in Mahanoy. So the Ninth Circuit also weighed in, and this is the, uh, actually we know the Supreme Court case of the uh, football coach who prayed privately on the 50 yard line after the game. Well, in the Ninth Circuit opinion, the dissent in the rehearing decision reported that Mahanoy ruled that neither students nor teachers shed First Amendment rights at the, at the schoolhouse gate, which was a repetition of Tinker. And we have our Supreme Court case, uh, which actually said that the football coach did have personal the personal right to uh, prayer to pray on the field, and the board reinstated him just just last well, what the end the, this month, the end of this month, um, by March 2023, and the Ninth Circuit here is going to rehear this case, um, Fellowship of Christian Athletes versus San Jose Uniform School District Board of Education, and this is um, a case that does involve LGBT also, the school district revoked the Christian Sports Ministry's local chapter status as an official school club, and the students sued arguing discrimination on the basis of religion. And the revocation stood, but the Ninth Circuit agreed to rehear the case on bonk, and oral arguments were just heard March 20th, but we don't know the outcome of that. Mahanoy was not cited with direct quotes, but as an example that students need to be taught to interact civilly. And here we have an interesting case, um, Chen versus Albany Unified School District, also in the Ninth Circuit, and several male high school students established a private Instagram account, which they used to bully and intimidate black students at the high school using the F word and the N word and talking about lynching and nooses. Here, this court, the Chen court decision from the Ninth Circuit cited Mahanoy 22 times, combining the Mahanoy decision with its own test of having a nexus to school because the um, Instagram account came to the, 
came to the attention of the school. The court reviewed the Mahanoy decision in its entirety and gave the opinion that Mahanoy said that the school had the ability to regulate social media speech that was severe bullying or harassment that targeted particular uh, students. And the Tenth Circuit, again, um, was almost a parallel to the Mahanoy decision itself. Uh, C1G, now that's, that's an interesting uh, plaintiff name. Actually, it's the father is CG and the son is called C1G. Uh, and he and his friends were goofing around in a thrift store, um, not really a hangout, but a thrift store, trying on wigs and hats. And C1G took a picture of one friend wearing a hat that resembled a World War II foreign military hat, posted it on Snapchat with the caption, me and the boys about to exterminate the Jews. The post was left up for only a few hours and C1G posted, sorry for the picture, it was a joke, but the school suspended C1G and then eventually expelled him and the district court upheld the ex expulsion. But between the district court and the court of appeals decision, Mahanoy was decided after the district court decision and not surprisingly with the parallel from Mahanoy, Mahanoy was cited in the 10th circuit case 16 times and C1G's expulsion was, was um, removed. Okay, and the quotes were Mahanoy all over again, but in considering student speech that occurs off campus and is unconnected to any school activity, the repetition of Breyer's uh, re parents rarely stand in local parentis. They, the school will have a heavy burden to justify intervention when political or religious speech is involved and must essentially especially respect an interest in protecting a student's unpopular expression. And Mahanoy identified those three features of off-campus speech that often, if not always, distinguish schools' efforts to regulate that speech from their efforts to regulate on-campus speech. And the last one, the 10th Circuit, uh, Gerson, uh, the California resident, Samantha Gerson, was sexually assaulted when her parents placed her in a residential treatment facility in Utah. Now this is a very jurisdictional case and it has nothing to do um, with her speech unless you say, yes, she was speaking to get a California jurisdiction for her case. Uh, she tried to sue the facility where she was sexually assaulted, where her parents, and she said in one point, at one point, her parents kidnapped her to Utah. But um, Alito's concurrence in Mahanoy, again, parents have the primary authority and duty to raise, educate, and form the character of their children. And ultimately, uh, she had to sue in Utah law, and the statute of limitations had expired there. And like Tinker, which was, uh, was a ruling in the K-12 context, Tinker has been applied in higher education. And there are three cases so far from higher education that are applying Mahanoy. Um, one of the team members of the University of Connecticut uh, who uh, raised her middle finger to a TV camera uh, there in that Rod Wan versus Manuel, the second circuit, uh, quoted Mahanoy and saved her athletic scholarship. And in Thompson v. Ragland, the 10th Circuit, um, emails uh, from a, a student who had a conflict with his chemistry teacher and uh, sent emails to his classmates, encouraging them to rate their professor, quote unquote, honestly. Um, and then speech first uh, versus Cartwright from the 11th Circuit, uh, an organization that protects student speech rights objected to Central Florida's policies on discriminatory harassment and bias, and Mahanui was cited as protecting unpopular speech. And I'm going to wrap it up by just saying that in 21 months, not even two years since the ruling was published, Mahanoy has been cited in six K-12 courts of appeals, the first, the fourth, the fifth, the seventh, the ninth, and the 10th, and Mahanoy has been applied in higher education in the second, 10th, and 11th circuit courts. So, and, and up to 80 total citations if you include citations in lower courts. And this emphasizes the words of Justice Breyer, 
sometimes it is necessary to protect the superfluous in order to preserve the necessary. So I know I've been rushing through because I want to give Dean Kaufman all of his half hour. I don't know if we'll have time for questions because um, everybody will be anxious for lunch, but thank you for your attention. I'll be happy to take questions. Uh, if you think of something later, I can take questions by email or send you a copy of this PowerPoint. So thank you very much. And I will um, ask our moderator to turn turn over the time to Dean Kaufman. Yeah, thank you, Deacon. That um, was a great presentation there, and hopefully we'll have some time for uh, questions um, here at the end, or folks could put those questions in the, uh, the chat as well, and we'll work on uh, doing what we can to get to those. So um, at this point, I'd like to turn it over to Dean Kaufman for his presentation. He has right. some slides as well. Thank you. I hope you can all see that. Is that okay? Yeah. Can you switch the views at the top on the display setting? We have your behind the scenes version. Yeah, just swap them there. Yep. Better? No. Yes. Great. Okay. Well, thank you so much, uh, Dean Hasi, and thank you to, to Jane um, and the entire Law Journal for uh, inviting me to this really wonderful symposium. It's been a great uh, day so far. I've been really impressed with the discussion and I'm trying to think about ways in which to build on that, especially given um, Professor Khan's wonderful presentation and analysis of Mahanaya and its progeny. Um, you'll see though that I'm gonna try to put into context the most recent Supreme Court cases involving the First Amendment issues in schools in the larger context of higher education generally, in which I'm going to suggest to you all very modestly that we can build uh, the future of higher education by reconciling the value of freedom of expression, the First Amendment values within that, with trauma-informed practices and relationship building. And in some ways, as I thought about this title, uh, given the last panel, uh, it could be reframed as reconciling freedom of expression with empathy and harm avoidance. So I'm hoping very much to tug out in those threads we've been uh, creating together this morning and throughout the day. Um, and so the question is, how are we going to reconcile freedom of expression with trauma-informed practices? Can that be done? And my view, of course, is yes, that it can be done, but uh, we are frankly facing tremendous structural challenges throughout higher education that set the landscape for that kind of reconciliation. And here are some of the challenges I think you're all very familiar with, especially Dean Hussey and other administrators at the law school level. Um, we know, um, we talked about a little bit today as well, that access and affordability is a huge challenge facing all of institutions of higher learning. Um, you may know that the tuition for colleges in America has risen 134% over the last 10 years. And that is priced out of education uh, for a lot of people who can't afford to go to it. And as a consequence, the, uh, the amount of debt that students incur to go to colleges and universities is crushing the point of $1.7 trillion of debt now is piled upon students who graduate from colleges. And that creates a tremendous problem for access and affordability that really is a challenge to all colleges and universities throughout the country. Part of that challenge though, it is really invited by a flawed business model in which our universities and colleges are dependent almost entirely on tuition revenue for the revenue sources. And therefore there's an incentive to increase tuition to drive up that revenue source, which in turn gives rise to an incentive, perversely somewhat, to uh, uh, increase discount rates for selected groups of students. That business model really does encourage us to make uh, tuition uh, higher and, and therefore to deny further access and affordability as part of our business model at the college and university level. And of course, we are all trying very hard these days to mitigate enterprise risk. We're emerging from a pandemic, which is a huge shock to the systems of colleges and universities, but there are all uh, other risks out there as well. Risks, for example, to violence on campus, sadly, um, active shooters are a serious enterprise risk. Cybersecurity is an emerging risk throughout our campuses, but so too is climate change. And then the, the next issue I think that is, we've already talked about a bit today is 
how can we build a diverse community in this environment of polarization throughout the country? And in particular, um, I think it's fair to say that in June, the Supreme Court is going to make it much more difficult, if not impossible, for colleges and universities to uh, enroll a diverse class of students. It's going to outlaw the use of race in admissions, uh, and that's going to make it very difficult for us to build a diverse community going forward. All of which, all those shocks, all those challenges, in my mind, lead to a value proposition concern. How valuable is higher education these days? And so we all have a collective interest, in my mind, in strengthening the value proposition in at least two ways. Number one, the economic value of an education has to be made visible. And the good news there is that there is really good evidence, research-based evidence, about the value of higher education. A college degree is valuable. There's a great uh, return on investment for that relative to stu students who don't go to college. Graduate school is incredibly valuable. And uh, I'll share with you all, law school has an incredibly strong return on investment. So we can make the case for the economic value of education. But far more importantly in this context, in my view, is the social or political case for higher education. In this context, this is where Justice Breyer, as Kathleen mentioned, refers to really K through 12 districts as nurseries of democracy. But I think it's fair to say that um, we've often thought uh, of colleges and universities as the breeding grounds for democracy, the cultivation of citizenship, the nursery of democracy as well. And so in this context, Justice Breyer's comments in Mount Hanoi had tremendous resonance. You know that we have long thought of colleges and universities to be uh, marketplaces of ideas and therefore valuable as centers of learning and of the conflict of ideas so that truth wills out in that clash of different ideas. And so we look to universities and colleges as a breeding ground for progress and history and also for the creation of justice. We want to protect unpopular ideas, according to Justice Breyer, in schools that allow for the free exchange of ideas are a good way to do that. They are also breeding grounds for citizenship. They help us practice the engagement of ideas across difference. They facilitate an informed public, according to Justice Breyer and Mahanoy. And they develop laws, help us develop laws that reflect the people's will. His vision in, in Mahanoy was that because at the university level, there's great interchange of ideas, um, popular ideas and unpopular ones as well, that the legislature somehow learns from that process and can reflect better the popular will in its lawmaking function. And then as well, Justice Breyer reminds us that when we see in college and university, the interplay of ideas, the freedom of expression of ideas, good and bad, we learn to value by our lived experience that process as well. And that become, becomes very important to us as citizens when we emerge from college. So the very strong argument here for the value of college as a breeding ground for democracy, a, a nursery of democracy as well. And the question is, is that still true? Well, let's assume for a moment that it is, but the question is how can we reconcile that value of providing an open forum for the exchange of difficult ideas, no matter how unpopular, discomforting or offensive, with another very strong competing value that was mentioned a lot this morning already the value of rejecting harm, harmful expression that is contrary to a university's mission or its educational, moral, community, and even religious principles. Can we reconcile those two very strong competing values in a way that will um, be conducive to learning, conducive to actually the interchange of ideas, conducive to empathy and harm avoidance, and conducive to building relationships as well? Well, I think we can, and I wanna to suggest to you a pathway forward and hopefully we'll, we'll stir some conversation uh, throughout the rest of your day. Here's, here's the path, I think, and here's where it begins. We have to realize together, free speech under the First Amendment is not in fact absolute. It's a very strong value, but it's never been and it should not be absolute. We know, for example, for sure, that universities may impose very important time, place, and manner restrictions on speech, including requiring that student groups actually collaborate before a speaker comes to campus and share with each other in advance notice that a speaker might come to campus and invite each other to engage in a process of collaboration and relation building. Why don't we have another panelist on this panel, for example? Why don't we 
um, have a competing panel, an alternative forum, or a process in which we can actually have a real authentic conversation and build some relationships. Schools and colleges can create that kind of environment, and that will not be a violation of the First Amendment as a time, place, and manner restriction. We also know from the example at Stanford not too long ago that schools and colleges and law schools can preclude disruption by audience, audience members in a way that will disrupt speakers on campus, that will silence speakers on campus. Dean Jenny Martinez just wrote a, a wonderful, in my view, message to the community saying that she was going to discipline essentially students on campus who tried to shout down and disrupt the speaker who was a federal society, a federal judge. Uh, and she said in a very, uh, very uh, research-based and citation-heavy message to the community that the First Amendment does not preclude schools from precluding disruption of speakers on campus. We know that's true. But more importantly for our purposes, we also know, as Kathleen Kahn suggested, the First Amendment does not protect expression that is a very long list now, a through line from Tinker all the way to Mount Hanoi. And it's a very long list, but bear with me. Schools like Widener Law School can preclude speakers who intentionally and effectively provoke a crowd to carry out violence. It can preclude speakers uh, where their speech is directed to an individual and likely provoke an imminent violent reaction. There's good law on that score. And more important to our purposes today, a school can preclude speakers that engage in serious bullying, harassment, or their speech is intended to cause, here we go, harm that is targeted to individuals or even to groups. It can also preclude speech as a true threat to others, including teachers and students, interferes with school rules regarding assignments and homework, for example, that's lewd or offensive, that's the Fraser case, it's defamatory, libelous, or slanderous, that goes back to the founding, is part of school-sponsored activities, that's Kohlmeyer, that compromises school security, it advocates illegal drug use, the Friedrich case, the Vaughn case for Jesus case, you may remember. Uh, and then right out of Mount Hanoi, just a, a year or so ago, speech that we can forecast will be disruptive to classwork or involve substantial disorder or invasion of the rights of others. That list is a combination of Mount Hanoi, but also a late, the latest sort of article from Erwin Chemerinsky, who is a great source on all things First Amendment. It's a very liberal list, frankly, from his point of view. Even in the most liberal version of the First Amendment, schools can preclude this list of speech. Um, so we know from this list as well that if schools want to, the First Amendment does not preclude them from, in turn, precluding uh, prohibiting expression on campus that may cause trauma or group defamation. Trauma and group defamation is harmful in this context, and here's why. Expression that does cause harm, cause, cause trauma, causes harm. It is to be distinguished, though, from expression that is merely offensive. Offensive speech is protected by the First Amendment. Even speech that is, in some ways, odious or discomforting or um, really awful or mocking in some ways, and that will cause a, a reaction hyperbolic speech is all protected by the First Amendment. And the theory here is that it will encourage their audience members to respond to it with more and perhaps better speech. But by contrast, expression that causes or makes worse, aggravates trauma, does cause harm to individual or groups and can be prevented from the <clears throat> First Amendment. And so too, group defamation and trauma can be prevented as well. And here I cite the case of Bahrainese against Illinois from 1952, a case that is often forgotten, but is still very good law to this day. What was that case about? Well, you may know that Joseph Bahrainese um, tried to uh, distribute leaflets in Chicago in the 1950s. The leaflets were um, defamatory to an entire uh, race of citizens, uh, yeah. only Black people in Chicago. And in doing so, Joseph Barnes violated a criminal statute in Illinois that prohibited expression which exposes the citizens of any race, color, creed, or religion to contempt, derision, or obloquy, strong public criticism or verbal abuse, which is productive of breach of the peace or riots. That statute that made it 
a crime to do that was upheld by the Supreme Court in a decision written by Justice Frankfurter, in which he said, purveyors of falsehood concerning racial or religious groups promote manifold injustice adjustments for required for free order life in the polyglot community, and therefore it can be prohibited by the state. And so he was saying essentially that group defamation, harm to an entire group of people leads to violence, per se violence, undermines the values of our communities, and it violates the rights of its targets. And therefore, the First Amendment does not protect expression that defames private individuals or groups because it harms our basic concept of essential dignity and the work of every human being, a concept rooted in the very concept of ordered liberty. This case in 1922 is still very good law, and it allows the state of Illinois, and the state of Pennsylvania, the state of California, or schools within it, public or private, to preclude expression that does involve group defamation that causes harm to groups by defaming them as a group and thereby causing group trauma. So that still gives us play in the joints in the First Amendment to infect man speech that does cause this kind of severe harm and trauma. So what is trauma? It is not mere offense. Trauma is not drama. It's real harm. Trauma results from an event or circumstances that is experienced by individuals or as we'll see by groups that is physically or emotionally harmful or threatening and has lasting adverse effects on that person's functioning and physical, social, emotional, or spiritual well-being. It does cause real harm that can be measured. And within that concept of trauma, there is the concept of group trauma or racial trauma or historical trauma as cumulative emotional or psychological harm that's resulting from a group traumatic experience across generations within a community often associated with racial or ethnic harm over intergenerational losses, assaults on cultures and well-being. So together, we know therefore the First Amendment does not preclude a school or a university or a law school from curtailing speech that causes group or individual harm or trauma. But the question is, if a university can preclude that expression that defames individual groups, this is not content-based, but it's about harm. If it can do so, the real question for us today is going forward, should it do so? The mere fact that a school can do this is not required to do so. It's got a choice to make. Should it in fact use its power to curtail this speech? When answering that question, I wanna to suggest to you all that there's a spectrum of responses out there appropriately. And here's why. If we go back to my first point, which is that there are serious challenges facing higher education today, one way out is for each school, including each law school, to decide what its own distinctive strengths are, what its distinctive mission is, and to build on those strengths as their own particular culture or environment or community. And so within that concept of building on your strengths, there is, in my view, a continuum of responses to the question, should a school try to curtail this kind of harmful speech or not? There is the absolutist model, which many universities hold on to, in which a school will not and cannot, in their view, in any way regulate speech that is based on the speaker's viewpoint, no matter how offensive or bigoted, only specifically targeted threats can be curtailed. And I'll share with you that many schools abide by this approach. The University of Chicago, a private school, is very proud of the fact that this is its policy. It believes the answer to the most heinous speech is only more speech, not less speech. And it's very proud of that approach. It's one of its strengths. By contrast, and in my view, by healthy contrast, your law school has a very different approach. From your policy, you may, under your policy as a private school, um, curtail speech if it would result in a, a violation of safety, if a speaker or event would advocate violence, hatred, harassment, discrimination, or other action that is incompatible with our obligations of lawyers, or would undermine or disrupt the school's regular environment, or in the discretion of Dean Hussey, <laughs> would not contribute to your mission. 
a very broad, in my view, strong policy that recognizes the reconciliation, the balance between unbridled free speech and values that you hold dear as a distinctive strength in your community. And in my uh, experience as a dean of a Jesuit law school, a Jesuit university provost, here is our uh, basic speech code. We want to create an environment in which all members are treated with dignity and respect. It's part of our calling as a Jesuit university. And therefore, our speech policy flows from that distinctive strength. We can prohibit expressions of bias or hate that intimidate, mock, degrade, or threaten members of our community. This is a radical empathy kind of policy that will lead us to think about whether speech is harmful to individuals or groups. And the question is, you know, where should law schools or universities fall on this continuum? And again, I think it's important to know they have a choice, but I think you, you probably can predict how I think the choice should be struck. I think if you really are serious these days about generating and creating a learning environment in which people are really um, empathetic and the relationships that are conducive to learning and advancing knowledge, you will reconcile these competing values as follows. You will think about seriously as a school prohibiting trauma, aggravating defamation, which really causes harm, and encourage, to the contrary, an environment in which you build relationships across differences. That, my friends, is not unconstitutional. And in fact, it promotes foundational First Amendment principles. If we go back to the founding and realize that libel was banned at the founding and think about seriously John Locke, Thomas Jefferson, James Madison, and look deeply into the Federalist Papers, we'll know that they were not First Amendment absolutists at all. They understood the value of relationship and empathy even in terms of developing freedom of thought and expression and then a fusion of knowledge. The notion of a radical First Amendment doctrine really did not come from the founding. It came from the, the century's view of the First Amendment. So too, a real authentic view of our association's democracy from Tocqueville and Mill would lead us to think about how associations are as important to the marketplace of ideas as our radical expressions. In fact, a real authentic view of John Stuart Mill would not lead us to an unbridled expression of ideas to the contrary. You know, Mill is famous for saying that the only way you can regulate speech if it does, if it does harm to others. But John Stuart Mill would recognize that harm includes not just physical harm, but also emotional harm as well. And in my view, would recognize trauma as that kind of harm. He wouldn't say the word trauma, but he would allow us to curtail speech that engaged in that kind of trauma causing harm. And I want to invite you to take a look again at this case in LACP against Alabama from quite some time ago, but still a very good law in which the Supreme Court recognized that speech is really only valuable to the extent that, in, that it is conducive to building relationships, associations, and recognize the right to speech as being very much tied with associational rights and not separate from them. And so if we were serious about First Amendment principles, and our real association in democratic values, and also serious about the function of a university these days, which is to really be sources of learning and the advancement of knowledge, we would realize that the key to building knowledge and the key to learning is building relationships. We now know from our latest brain research, neuroscience, our greatest psychologists and educational theorists, that the way to create a transformative learning community is to create an environment in which we build relationships, not in which knowledge is competitive or in which speech is paired against each other, but instead in which we collaborate, build empathy, and relationships across difference. We know that from a whole list of brilliant people, Bruce Perry about trauma, Howard Gardner about building habits of mind for the future in a learning environment that is relational. We know about that from Dan Kahnema, Kahneman, who tells us that happiness is built upon relationships. Catherine McKinnon, the feminist scholar who understood how harmful words can be and how important it is to build a, a relationship uh, in inducing kind of environment at a school or law school. My colleagues, Alex Sestis and Steve Ramirez, who understand how the First Amendment values really can be shaped around ensuring that people have dignity 
in their personhood and identity in a school environment. And Arturo Sosa, who happens to be the Father General of Society of Jesus, the father of all the Jesuits, who understands that you don't build democracies by <coughs> radical trauma-inducing, trauma-causing speech. You build democracies by building empathy and relationships across difference. So my view, and I would love for you to push back on it and think about it, is you build the future of higher education by, in fact, reconciling the important value of freedom of expression, but with the equally important value of prohibiting trauma and by engaging in trauma-informed practices and by building relationships that are conducive to building knowledge and happiness, success, and well-being. Thank you so much. I look forward to your questions and reflections. Thanks so much. Thank you, Dean Kaufman, and thank you, Dr. Khan. Those remarks have been great. Um, I invite anyone that has any questions to either raise your hand or you can chat send the, the chat directly to me and I will share it with them. Uh, it looks like Aaron has a question. Hi, um, I really enjoyed both of your presentations. And one thing that you were ending with, Michael, which ties into the first panel, uh, was this notion of empathy and how do we build empathy on campus? And I'm also at a Jesuit institution. Um, and so, you know, in the aftermath of Stanford, I also really love Jenny Martinez's letter. And she sort of alludes in the letter that there's going to be some sort of school-wide conversation. And I'm curious, you know, what you're doing at Santa Clara or, you know, Kathleen, what you're doing at your institution around these notions of having these conversations. Yeah, Aaron, thanks for the question. I'll, I'll share a couple of things. I mentioned a bit in, in my mark, remarks about building a culture in which um, affinity groups, student groups don't have to, but are encouraged to meet with each other and collaborate with each other before um, a speaker comes to campus. Um, so that, for example, the panel is inclusive of all views and this, the actual st students actually uh, are enforced but are encouraged to dialogue with each other across difference and build uh, student on student relationships. Um, that's been really helpful here at Santa Clara. We have a very strong federal society here. Uh, the leader of that society also uh, always engages with the other opinion groups before speakers come to campus. As a consequence, instead of having um, a bubble uh, approach to a, sp a speaker. We have a, an environment in which um, all students are invited to all um, affinity group speeches and they, they come and share the experience together and are respectful across difference. And it, there's really genuine learning that goes on. The other um, thing I would share is that we have a culture now, uh, restorative justice circles, um, which are not um, just when harm is in, it occurs in the in community, but when harm occurs outside the community. So for example, when Dobbs came out, um, we have we had a circle process in place. We have something called Circle Mondays on campus. Every Monday, we set up circles and we invite our students, faculty, and administrative team to gather in circles and engage in restorative justice techniques for anything that's on their mind. So it's part of the culture when, um, when trauma does in fact affect the community. Thanks for the question. Thank you. We still have... A few moments here if there's other folks with questions. Well, if not, um, Dr. Khan, I have a question for you to get your thoughts on this. So um, in the, the Charter Day School, the question certified for certiori um, about whether contractors are state actors, what other uh, what repercussions might that have? That seems to be a pretty broad question that could affect a lot of private institutions and others that might not consider themselves to be state actors. That's exactly what, what I was fearful of. Um, you know, when, when I saw that there had been the petition for certiari, because it's tremendously, just tremendously impactful, not only for public charter schools, but also for private institutions. And um, 
we don't know where the Supreme Court is going. Um, I, I just recently, I just recently, um, actually, the Education Law Reporter just recently published um, a paper of mine on um, from the uh, Florida actually transgender students use of school bathrooms, the Adams versus St. John's County School District, and um, it, it it ended up it ended up to be a very political decision, and. Um, it, it is a decision that should be asking for certiorari, but basically it was a rehearing en banc, seven, seven members of that en banc court were appointed by Republican presidents, seven out of 11. And the uh, decision was that this gender, male transgender student could not use the bathroom of his gender identity in schools. Now. Look at the political, look at the politics here. Seven members appointed by Republican presidents ruled against the use of the male bathrooms by this transgender man, now man, uh, um, and four dissenters who had been elevated to the 11th circuit by Democratic presidents. And I go back to an article about how the Supreme Court decides to grant certiorari. And it's usually related to the ideology of the president that appointed them. So now if we want to, if we want to send this case about the transgender students' use of bathrooms to the Supreme Court, we have a 6-3 split on the Supreme Court. So if we send this to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court rules along political lines, the way it might, um, we have taken away the rights of all the transgender students whose courts of appeals uh, are, are allowing them to use their gender identity bathrooms. So right now we're in a 6-3 split on a lot of things in the Supreme Court. So if the Supreme Court now gives certiorari to the charter day school, what is the outcome going to be based on a political alignment of the Supreme Court justices? Are we going to get state action imposed upon all private schools? as a result of a Supreme Court decision? Or, you know, or, or is the Supreme Court inclined to leave public charter school uh, leaders and, 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 you know, boards of trustees? Are, are, is the Supreme Court going to rule in a political way to say that they can still remain as private entities? We, we don't know, we don't know. Yeah. We, don't, we don't know where that's going to go. Yeah, that'll be, it, well, we'll have to see if they take it first, I suppose, but it could be yeah, quite. So, I mean, uh, and, and right now I'm looking at a whole bunch of en banc decisions and looking at the alignment, uh, who appointed this justice, who appointed this judge, you know, it's, um, it's been very, it's, it, it's a very interesting analysis. Let me just put it that way. It's a very interesting analysis. And I think it'll probably take me about six months to do all the research to write another paper about that. Well, we look forward to it. Dean Kaufman, there's just one more question there for you. And then we'll bring this to an end because I know folks want to get to lunch. Um, yes, about whether um, it's possible to measure trauma objectively. I think trauma rightly understood is an objective um, diagnosis. Um, Dr. Bruce Perry, who I mentioned a bit in, in my presentation, has done a lot of work on the physical manifestations of trauma. It can be measured. It's not, again, it's not just um, um, discomfort. There's a serious psychological and physiological reaction to trauma at the individual level. But I think a more um, difficult question is how do you measure or objectively measure trauma at the group level? What's interesting to me is I mentioned Baharnais. There was a presumption in that case that when someone defames an entire group of people by their race or religion, the presumption is that is traumatic. 
um, because uh, it's false. You can't possibly um, say something about an entire group of people that would be true. And the presumption of the falsehood and the presumption that the falsehood about an entire group of people would give rise to a breach of the peace is what uh, Justice Frankfurt really latched onto in Bahrainese. So the presumption is that there's going to be um, a traumatic response to any kind of group defamation, not the other way around, which is really interesting to me. So it's a great question. Thank you. Thank you for the question. And so this will bring our uh, second panel here to an end. I'd like to, again, thank uh, Dr. Khan and Dean Kaufman for joining us and for their presentations. It has been an outstanding hour. We're very grateful for you making time in your busy schedules to join us today. And now thank I will so hand it back hand it back over to Jane. Thank you, Din Hussey. Thank you again for moderating the panel. Uh, thank you, Dean Kaufman, for joining us from sunny California. And Dr. Khan, um, it was a pleasure. I just wanted to remind you to fill out the survey that was sent through the chat so you can get the credit for the CLEs. Um, we'll break for lunch, enjoy your lunch, and we'll reconvene at 1230 for the next panel. Thank you. Welcome back. I hope everybody had um, a nice lunch. If you're just joining us for the first time today, um, it's been welcome. It's been a wonderful day so far. And I'm very excited to announce the next panel. The next panel um, is going to be dealing with institutional pressures and changes in public education and will be moderated by Professor um, here in Widener Law Commonwealth, Professor Family. Hello, <clears throat> excuse me. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. It's my pleasure to moderate this panel. And I want to in advance thank our speakers for volunteering their time to help us talk about these important issues. The way that this panel is going to work is we are going to have um, each of our speakers speak for about 10 minutes. And then we'll have some time for questions at the end. And I'll give a brief introduction for each speaker um, before they speak. And you are more than welcome to put your questions in the chat where I'll be able to see them. And then I will select questions um, to ask our panelists. So um, our first speaker is Linda Ramby, and she is the Chief Legal Officer at the Pennsylvania School Board Association. And in her previous work for the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, she has worked for the Governor's Office of General Counsel at the Board of Probation and Parole. She has also worked uh, for the Pennsylvania State Police and the Pennsylvania Higher Education Assistant Agency. She also spent some time um, in private practice, and we are happy to say she is an alum of our law school, of Wider Law Commonwealth, where she is a very active alum as well. So please join me in welcoming Linda to get our panel started. Thank you, Jill. Um, with that, I guess I will share my screen. I put a couple of slides together and make sure everybody can see that. All right. So I'm going to talk quickly about um, the education of uh, in Pennsylvania, the history of education in Pennsylvania. Education, um, the history in education is very long and complex. It dates back to the colonial period. Um, it's been going on for a long, long time. And that's a good thing, actually, because back in those days, it was realized how important public education was. But to understand, this was around the time of the Revolutionary War. Education was really less promising than in any other period sent before or since. Life in the New World was quite unfavorable for the transmission of learning. Um, the masses were, quite frankly, too poor and too busy earning a living to um, be absorbed in, and they were too absorbed in the political and religious landscape to really provide education for their children. And with that kind of environment, even before the Revolutionary War, uh, William Penn um, 
put this together. So William Penn is the founder and founding father of uh, Pennsylvania. And they had what were called back then frames of government. And this is from the frame of government of 1682. And he created one of the most, William Penn created one of the most liberal and generous outlines of government seen to, the, to his time in the constitution or frame for Pennsylvania. This reflects on the commonly held view of the Englishmen that the government had a responsibility to see that young people should receive some education so that they might not be a drain on society. However, there are indications that this provision back in those days was not enforced, perhaps due to political upheavals, or perhaps uh, because the civic responsibility was interpreted erratically um, throughout the colonial period. So we keep moving forward, and now we're up to the Revolutionary War. And this is kind of where um, the, the educational phases in Pennsylvania had two phases. The first one was the establishment in all parts of the Commonwealth of endowed academies. And these academies taught um, a small number of destitute pupils and they were taught for free. And then the second one was the free instruction of poorer children in existing church schools and neighborhood schools. Most of the churches offered some form of elementary education in neighborhood schools were also organized, but still many children did not receive even the mere rudiments of an education. So then we move forward to the Constitution, the Pennsylvania Constitution of 1776. And this is the clause that was um, part of that Constitution. And this was an attempt to establish free school in Pennsylvania by constitutional and legislation actions. And this was one of those attempts um, back in the days. And this clause established what became known as pauper schools, but it did not have a widespread reach and it was not accomplishing its goal. Public schooling had really quite frankly failed to gain traction in the poor and more remote areas of Pennsylvania. And honestly, a significant portion of Pennsylvania students and children were not getting educated and they didn't have any schools to attend. So we moved a couple years down the road to the constitution of 1790 and this was the clause that became part of that. And this constitution was Pennsylvania's first constitution as a sovereign commonwealth. This section um, as first introduced was opposed by the Friends of Public Education um, because in its original form, it would have made unconstitutional any law establishing free public schools or making schools free to uh, the poor folks. Following this action, efforts on behalf of the general public education were directed uh, to the end of providing free instruction for the education of children of the poor at public expense in existing schools. So thus, during the first, pretty, quite frankly, during the first 50 years of Pennsylvania statehood, the extent of civic responsibility was only to those children whose parents were too poor to provide to tuition. And that's how they became known as pauper schools. So as this provision was implemented, a subsidy was available from state funds for children of, pa of paupers so that their tuition might be provided in existing schools. However, in order to get the money, it was necessary for parents to make a public recognition of their poverty, which really became objectionable, an objectionable feature and quite frankly embarrassed parents from sending their children to school. So they just didn't do it, meaning the children were not sent to school. The next big, big, big thing that happened in public education in Pennsylvania was the Free School Act of 1834. This was the first law that established a system of public schools that were free and accessible to all children, regardless of their social or economic status. It directed that each ward, township, and borough would constitute a school district. It provided for the election of school directors in each district, and each district was able to determine if it wanted to accept the provisions of the Free School Act. Those districts which agreed to accept it um, would get a free uh, state subsidy for free education. And then the expectation was that if that didn't cover the cost, the remainder came from the local populace. populace. So that was paid from by, by local funds. Approximately half of the newly created school district accept, accepted this legislation. And then probably by 1837, about three quarters of the potential school districts accepted it. But again, it wasn't a hundred percent exception, except acceptance. 
Um, which takes us to our current education clause, which has been part of the litigation in the, the now infamous school funding case that just came down. This clause, it's, this is the clause from Article 3, Section 14. And this clause was first included in the state's constitution in 1874. It was put in there in response to concerns over the quality of public education in Pennsylvania. And at the time, many Pennsylvanians felt that the existing system was inadequate and that it failed to provide students with the skills and knowledge they needed to succeed in life. I wanna point out that there is no equivalent clause of this nature in the United States Constitution to this moment. And that takes us to the first public school code of 1911. Prior to the passage of this law, there was no unified system of public education in Pennsylvania. So what this law did was it established a system of free public education throughout the state, and it set standards for the administration, funding, and the curriculum of public schools. The local school districts were largely responsible for the management and funding of their own schools, though. There was not a, like a, a state oversight necessarily and by, uh, in this code. Some other things the code did, it created um, the State Board of Education, which was designed to oversee the administration of public schools. However, the local control and all the local stuff stayed at the local level. It also established the, um, the superintendent of public instruction, um, which we'll get a little bit more into, but the powers of the state board were basically to report and recommend to the governor and the general assembly any legislation that needed to improve the schools. It wasn't what you see with the secretary of education today. And then it also had the, the members serving four years, the school board members that were elected. And some one other thing, it required the school children from eight to 16, this has since changed to, to attend school. And the law established a standardized curriculum for public schools that included English, math, science, and social studies. But this was soon replaced a couple years, to, couple decades down the road with this current law. And that's what this is what governs the school codes, the Pennsylvania schools today is a public school code of 1949. Um, it was enacted on March 10th and it replaced the school code of 1911. This act, this school code was a result of many, many years. If you look at the history, it's unbelievably um, how passionate people were and it was great to see. Um, discussions, debates among education stakeholders, educators, policymakers, community leaders about, do we want to provide free education? How should this education look? Um, do we have a civic responsibility to educate our students? And this is the law that established the, what was then called the Department of Public Instruction, which is now called um, the Department of Education in, uh, in Pennsylvania. It created, the big thing it did was it created this public school funding stream and that it established formulas for allocating state funds to school districts based on student enrollment and local property values. Still, that's the system that's in place today and it's constantly being tweaked. But I wanted to quickly, quickly, and I only have a minute, is talk about the effects of the Sputnik. Uh, on October 4th, 1957, this dramatic event in the Soviet Union where they launched a satellite. Um, and this, this event caused Congress to pay attention to education. And they responded, Congress, the federal Congress, by authorizing legislation which would improve the competence of teachers in fields perceived to be crucial, such as science, math, and modern foreign languages. This was the first time the federal government had interceded in the academic areas of elementary and secondary school curriculum. And they're still there today. And then they passed in uh, 1965 under Lyndon Johnson, the Elementary and Se Secondary Education Act. And this was part of Lyndon Johnson's war on poverty. But at the end of the day, and the school system in Pennsylvania has now, has now oh, there's a couple of typos here, is not the result of historical accident. It's truly the product of countless conscious decisions that were made by educators, legislators, and school board members over the passage of two centuries. So I think that history was really helpful as you see the next couple of presenters in their topic. So I'll turn it back over to Jill. Thank you so much, Linda. That was really informative and helpful. And it's always interesting to learn about something that we have so much experience with on a day-to-day -day basis, but maybe we don't know the history or really thought about how, how the system got there. So we're gonna turn next to my colleague, Professor Quinn Yergain. 
Uh, Professor Yergain is an assistant professor of law at Weiner Law Commonwealth. We are so happy to welcome Professor Yergain this year to our faculty. Uh, Professor Yergain um, is an expert in state constitutional law and the relationship and organization of state governments. Um, they graduated from Emory University School of Law with high honors and as a Robert W. Woodruff Fellow. Uh, Professor Yergain was an, was an editor of the Emory Law Journal and also clerked for Judge Anderson of the 11th Circuit. Before coming to Weiner Law Commonwealth, Professor Yergain was the Associate Director of the Yale, Semel, Yale Center for Environment Law and Policy. So Professor Yergain, I will turn it over to you. I am a state constitutional law person, um, and my area of focus is thinking about institutions and structures. Um, and so my interest today is thinking about this when, when it comes to setting education policy in particular. Um, and so when we think about sort of the schoolhouse rock version of setting policy, for example, we think about voters electing politicians who in turn set policy. But there's a lot of questions that we can ask about this process. Um, when voters select politicians, who is actually elected? Um, how are these people elected? Are they elected in partisan elections or nonpartisan elections? What's the length of their terms? And how close are vo voters ultimately to this process? Similarly, when we think about the actual process by which these elected officials set policy, what powers do they actually have in doing so? Are they the ones who actually make decisions or are they appointing people who make those decisions? And what checks and balances exist on their power? Now, in the context of education in particular, I think there's something of a disconnect between voters and policy. And we can debate whether this is a good thing or a bad thing. But if we think about the last few years, education, broadly defined, whether we're talking about critical race theory uh, and bans on woke education or things like that, book bans, trans students, anything like that, um, we've had a lot of debates about education. Um, but it's kind of strange that we have so many debates and that voters feel as inflamed as they do, because education is democratic. We have a lot of elections in this country for school positions, um, but they seem to be out of the public eye to some extent. Oftentimes they're held in off-cycle years, for example, in odd-numbered years, um, not presidential, not midterms, but odd-numbered years. We have a lot of school board elections around the country. Oftentimes they're in nonpartisan elections uh, where voters are a little bit less sure about how to vote for people. Um, they don't have party IDs on the on the ballot uh, in about three quarters of the states. And as a result, incumbency is a much greater advantage here than it is in other places. Um, and voters just may not feel like they really know what they're voting on. Moreover, even if voters know what they're voting on and they want to elect people to do a certain thing, Policymaking in our country is really fractured. If you are upset, for example, at having police officers in schools, your options of fixing that when you're voting for school board are pretty limited because you might have a state law that requires police officers to be in schools, or you might have the sheriff um, who's actually the person responsible for placing officers in schools. Um, and so we have this kind of disconnect where even if you know what you wanna do, you may not really be able to do it. So thinking then about some of these selection mechanisms, we might ask, what should voters actually have the power to do? Should they be electing school boards? Should they be electing superintendents? Should they be picking both? What about officials at the state level? Should we have an elected state board of education? Should we have an elected superintendent? Should we have both? How should these elections actually be structured? Should they be partisan? Should they be nonpartisan? Is there actually an answer here that's going to work in all states, in all counties, in all municipalities? And when should we actually hold these elections? So if we think about how many officials there are in the United States, there's a lot of them. Um, this one estimate, for example, from Jennifer Lawless uh, last decade, estimates that there's about half a million elected officials in the United States. Um, and a good number of those, 95,000 out of that 500,000, are school district officials in some form or another. Um, and there's about 83,000 school board members. There's about 13,000 districts. 97% of districts have elected school board members. Um, and so we have a good percentage, a three quarters majority of school districts that are having elections this year alone, but they're not super high profile. 
Similarly, um, we might question how are we actually making these uh, decisions? Um, in the very, very early days of our country, we didn't have a lot of elected officials, including in education, but also more broadly. If you showed up to vote, for example, you might vote for some local officials, you might vote for the legislature, and a lot of states you wouldn't even vote for governor, um, and you certainly wouldn't be voting for a state superintendent of public education. As the, the, 18th, as the 19th century progressed, um, there were a lot of democratic pressures to increase voters' ability to engage with their government. And so we had a lot of reforms. In particular, we saw the introduction of more statewide elected officials like elected superintendents or much more rarely elected state boards. And they were elected in partisan elections. But in the beginning of the 20th century, for example, a lot of education reformers and progressive reformers in particular wanted to end the election of superintendents. They wanted to, in their own words, professionalize education. They wanted it to be something where you had a superintendent who was selected not because they were a Republican or a Democrat, but because they were the most qualified person to do so. And so if we if we look at over time at what states have actually done, um, up until the mid 20th century, really, a supermajority of states had elected superintendents. But beginning in the early 1900s, and really after 1950, the percentage of states that have elected state boards of education dramatically increases. You can actually see these lines move, you know, sort of converging with each other. It's a mirror where as the superintendents go down, the number of state boards of education goes up. And so that's what we're voting on in a solid 25% of the states or so. You're voting on a member of the state board of education who picks then the superintendent. And across the country, we see this sort of split where in a lot of Southern states, in a lot of um, Plain states and Western states, we still have elected superintendents, but then in other large swaths of the country, we have elected state boards of education. But no, for example, there's a lot of states that don't have any elected education officials at all, but they used to. Um, a lot of the states that are covered in gray now used to elect a state superintendent of education. So, um, when we think about this also, we might question how are we electing people in terms of partisan or nonpartisan elections? Um, one of the other reforms that was really started in the early 20th century was this idea that we should take education out of politics. Um, a noble idea and one that progressives thought the best way to do that was by providing nonpartisan elections. So we had constitutional amendments to do this. We had uh, statutory changes to do this. Um, and we converted a fair number of these state superintendents, state school boards, um, local school boards, and local superintendents as well into nonpartisan elections. And the usual process here was you would have your statewide primary, all the candidates would run in a nonpartisan primary, and then the top two candidates would advance to the general election. Um, and so we see a growth then, returning to the chart from before, we see a growth then in the percentage of states that have nonpartisan officials who are elected that way. Right now, it's about 20%. Um, and so this is true with respect to uh, state superintendents themselves and state school boards. Um, a good number, as, as I said, about a quarter of states, um, especially those in the West and those in the Midwest, have nonpartisan elections for either their superintendent or their school board. Um, and so if you look at actually uh, how many state boards are elected this way, most state boards are still elected in partisan elections, um, as is the case with superintendent elections themselves. Um, but you have this growth, this idea that we should be electing these people, but we shouldn't be doing it in nonpartisan elections. We also then, if we have a state board of education, um, we have to, in most states, uh, with the exception of Michigan, we elect them by district, which means that we have to draw districts to elect members of state boards of education. And so we either have to draw new districts or we have to use existing ones. Um, we could draw entirely new districts from scratch or we could use something that already exists like congressional districts. In most states, we have new districts that are created. Um, only Nevada and Colorado use um, congressional districts for any part of their education governance. But in most states, we have new districts that are created. Well, then this poses a whole bunch of other problems. Um, are we drawing these districts in a way that ensures adequate representation? Because the Voting Rights Act surely applies to State Board of Education districts. It seems that the Supreme Court's rules in one person, one vote holdings apply here too. Um, so how are we going to draw these districts? 
Um, we're ha we have to do this on the same decennial cycle that we do congressional districts and state legislative districts. And in many states, we have to create minority majority districts to ensure that communities of color throughout the country have an opportunity to elect candidates of their choice. The problem though, is that if you live in a state where you have a state board of education elected by district, there's not a lot of conversation about actually doing this. Um, it's something that is not commonly litigated. It's not commonly fought over. Um, and to illustrate that, for example, there were debates in Louisiana last year about creating new uh, minority opportunity districts um, for Congress, for example. And the Democratic governor, John Bell Edwards, was strongly in favor of creating these new districts. But with respect to State Board of Education districts, he said, I'm not going to lose any sleep if we don't create a new minority majority district. Um, and this kind of mentality that we're not really caring about it that much is pretty indicative. Um, even after the 1960s and 70s, when it was clear that one person, one vote was the standard that we were using um, to elect members of these um, boards in drawing these districts, it still took states a while to get on that train. Um, and we don't have a lot of challenges to these districts today. Um, we have partisan gerrymandering challenges all over the country, but we don't have a lot of challenges in this context. Now, we might ask a lot of these questions with respect to school board elections as well. Um, and we might ask, you know, if we're thinking about the powers that they have, what powers should we have an elected state superintendent actually have? Um, and what you see in, in a lot of these cases is that the superintendents themselves don't even have the power to um, adopt rules and regulations, for example. Um, governors have a lot of control um, over uh, the education policy because they're, they're in the executive branch. Um, and so there's challenges then to this basic idea. Um, we're increasingly trying to put school boards under the control of governors in a lot of states, and we're having a lot of challenges to the uh, idea of separation of powers. For example, um, in Ohio right now, uh, there is a push to totally restructure the State Board of Education, which is elected right now, and to strip it of all of its powers and place all those powers in a department controlled by the governor. In Nebraska, for example, where it has nonpartisan state school board elections, um, there's a move to abolish this current system altogether. And then in some states like Florida, for example, there's this move to make uh, school board races partisan, to put partisan labels on the ballot. And we can debate whether we think that these are uh, good ideas or bad ideas. Um, but at the end of the day, uh, this is something that uh, we really have to think about. We have to think about what do we want our ideal allocation of power to be. Um, thank you very much for the opportunity to, to talk about this. Um, and I look forward to participating in the discussion. Thank you so much, Quinn. That was really thought provoking and had me thinking about <clears throat> my little borough in Pennsylvania and, and our school board and how it's elected. And so hopefully we can have more of a conversation uh, when we get to Q&A. But for right now, I wanna turn to uh, Professor Aaron Archer, who is an Associate Professor of Law at Detroit Mercy Law. And we're so glad to have Professor Archer with us this afternoon. Professor Archer is an expert in um, various legal subjects, including education law, commercial law, alternative dispute resolution, and Latino law and policy. She is the co-chair of the American Bar Association's section on dispute resolution ethics committee. She is the editor of the Michigan Dispute Resolution Journal. And she is the income, well, she's the chair now, I think, of the SBM dispute resolution section uh, for the State Bar of Michigan. And she is the 2021 chair of the American Association of Law Schools Education Law section. So please join me in welcoming Professor Archer. Hi, thanks everyone. Um, can everyone see my slides? Excellent. Um, so thank you for inviting me to participate in this symposium. Uh, one thing that wasn't on my CV is I actually began my journey in education law as a summer intern at the Education Law Center in Philadelphia. So as part of that, I took the train out to Harrisburg fairly often uh, to talk with the state legislature. So this is this is really fun. It feels like coming full circle. Um, so let me put on a timer to make sure that I keep honest. 
All right. Um, so I should preface this as uh, Professor Family was telling you that another one of my areas of interest is dispute resolution, particularly mediation. And so what I'm going to be talking about today sort of crosses into these two spaces, education law and dispute resolution, and also has some real common themes with what um, Quinn was just saying when they were explaining how different uh, the structures can look from state to state uh, and how that might be meaningful. So I want to start with a few propositions. Uh, restorative justice in various forms is already the law in the vast majority of jurisdictions throughout the United States, uh, despite many of these jurisdictions having very vague definitions of what restorative justice is. Um, many states are already administering restorative justice programs, especially with minors, either in the criminal or the educational context or both. Uh, restorative justice seems to be in the process of going undergoing a legal annexation, uh, similar to the development of mediation over the past 20 to 30 years. So sort of starting in a community context and then becoming more of a court-based or legal-based process. Um, and so I approach this project just by saying this. I don't want us to look back in 20 years and regret the way that restorative practices are being used in the United States, particularly in schools with children. So this project began uh, a few years back when I wrote an article called Restoring Justice in Schools that was prompted uh, by a video circulating in the disability law space about a young boy in Kentucky, SR, who was handcuffed by a school resource officer uh, behind his back, as you can see in this picture, and I apologize if this is disturbing for some people, I probably should have warned. Um, so in the article, I looked at a number of cases in which behavior by school resource officers, uh, which shorthand is police in schools, although Pennsylvania has a more nuanced uh, use of the term, um, where their behavior led to lawsuits by students' families. So in this particular case, there was an alleged uh, violation of the Fourth Amendment, and the court found that ultimately, yes, there was a violation of the Fourth Amendment. However, the individual school resource officer couldn't be held liable. He did have qualified immunity uh, because it was a close call whether he knew he was committing a constitutional violation. And ultimately, the court did say that the plaintiffs had a 1983 claim against the sheriff's office uh, because the sheriff's office had policies that expressly allowed the SROs to handcuff children. And so they found some liability there. So that ultimately ended up in a fairly significant settlement with the families in that case. And one of the things that I found very interesting when I was starting to look into school resource officers was that a lot of the training for school resource officers would have mention of restorative practices. And so I'll just say a few words about restorative practices. Um, so, Broadly speaking, restorative practices, and, and we heard these mentioned earlier in our pre-lunch presentation, are voluntary discussion practices that seek to create or support a sense of community. Uh, so it may involve things like repairing harm that's been done or reintegrating people into a community if, say, they've been incarcerated. Um, so in the justice system, it's seeking to address harms, give the harmed party an opportunity uh, to participate in sort of selecting accountability for the wrongdoer, for the um, person who committed harm, um, to return also the party who caused the harm uh, into the community by taking accountability for their actions. And oftentimes these kinds of processes involve um, the person who caused the harm to make some sort of reparation, um, whether that's restitution uh, to the harmed party, community service, um, a thoughtful apology, those sorts of reparations. And as you can see from my map, this notion of restorative practices really draws from a lot of different uh, strains of dispute resolution that come from all around the world. So uh, restorative conferencing in New Zealand, uh, truth and reconciliation in South Africa, 
uh, restorative circles in Canada and, and largely um, also in the United States. So for instance, here in Michigan, um, the Anishinaabe tribes often use restorative practices in tribal courts. And, you know, the, it's a porous border, right? So some of the tribes that are north of the border are here as well, right, in Michigan. Um, and then victim offender dialogues. And so this idea of victor offender mediation is largely where in the United States we've been popularizing restorative practices. And I mentioned earlier that Pennsylvania has a fairly nuanced uh, definition of school resource officers. And so thank you to Linda, our earlier presenter, who pointed out some of these things to me. Um, and so if you look at the Pennsylvania law that authorizes school resource officers, it expressly calls for them to train students in conflict resolution, restorative justice, and crime awareness. And you know, that's a different definition from, for instance, school police officers, uh, which are also you know, encoded in Pennsylvania law, but they aren't specifically tasked with that. So here in Pennsylvania, if you are a school resource officer, educating, training students about restorative justice is part of your mandate. Restorative justice often contrasted with criminal justice, and so criminal justice tends to look at, um, you know, what law has been broken, who did it, what does the lawbreaker deserve, and we typically say that in those processes, the um, person who has been harmed, or in criminal justice, you might say the victim, um, that they don't have much voice, um, they don't have much say in what the accountability is, you know, whether that's punishment, whether that's some sort of diversion process, the the person who's been harmed doesn't really have a part in that conversation. Whereas in restorative justice, it's very much oriented towards having that person who's been harmed uh, have a voice, express what their needs are, and then work towards figuring out how those needs can be met by both the wrongdoer and other members of the community. So as I mentioned, uh, the vast majority of jurisdictions now have restorative justice, specifically, you know, encoded in state law. And over the last 20 years, as you can see, it's been a huge jump where, you know, 20 years ago, you barely saw it. Now, almost every state in the country has some sort of restorative justice law. Um, I want to give an example of a state where I think does a good job with this, right? So this is Nebraska. Um, Nebraska got a fairly significant grant to start rolling out restorative justice in schools. And they have this very lengthy uh, definition of what restorative justice is. Um, I will contrast this, and you know, you can you can look at this. I won't read the whole thing to you, but I want to contrast this with Michigan, for example, which is where I live, where um, legislation was passed that was sort of billed as, well, we're rolling restorative justice, we're rolling restorative practices out in schools. Um, but if you look at the state law that I put up here, and you sort of look at what I'm highlighting, it's actually more aspirational use of restorative practices than actual use of restorative practices. And I can tell you that on the ground, uh, there's huge variation in how these processes are being used in schools uh, from some school districts that are really doing, um, I think, very high quality work in this area and other school districts where the restorative practitioners are essentially being asked to discipline students, which is not uh, within the sort of realm of what restorative um, practitioners really expect to be doing, um, nor should they be doing. So the question that I want to ask is, does the legalization of restorative practices uh, mean that they will ultimately become so diluted that they lose much of their value? And so I'm looking at things like um, the initial period in which these practices were adopted, how they've been codified. You know, as Quinn was saying, there's lots of different ways uh, to approach 
any sort of process at the state level. So how are they being implemented? Um, when they're being rolled out at a you know, school district-based level, what sort of model are we using? Are we using a whole school model? So for instance, uh, in our earlier presentation, when Michael was talking about Santa Clara and how they have you know, Circle Mondays, right? That is sort of a whole school model where it's not just being used when there's harm, but it's being used to sort of create a sense of community and build an environment. And then finally, uh, ongoing assessment and quality verification. And this is, I'm taking straight from the mediation space. How do we assess if this is working, right? Is it user satisfaction? Is it reduction in suspension and expulsions? Um, those sorts of things. So what are the actual metrics and how do we get that data? So thank you, everyone. I appreciate your time today, and I will stop sharing my screen. Thank you so much, Erin. It really gets us thinking about you know, the role of school resource officers or police officers in schools and how it can be um, much larger than just simply you know, providing security. So it's very interesting. Um, and also a reminder, if anyone has any questions, feel free to write them in the chat. You can either chat directly to me or you can chat to everyone. So our last speaker is Dr. Raquel Munez. And Dr. Munez is an assistant professor at Boston College Lynch School of Education and Human Development. And so we're lucky to have Dr. Munez's uh, unique perspective in that she is a, uh, has a PhD and a Juris Doctorate. So she has experience um, with education issues, both from a legal and a policy and scholarly perspective. Um, and her research is grounded in examining oppressive power structures and the strategies to disrupt them in education. So I will turn it over to Dr. Munoz. Thank you so much for the, the kind introduction. I am absolutely uh, honored and excited to be here in conversation with, um, with our uh, panelists and overall to be part of the symposium. So thank you to the Law Review and thank you to, um, to our moderator and uh, fellow panelists. So I am going to be sharing my screen here as well. <clears throat> and it is um, allergy season, so I have to apologize in advance um, with my allergy situation over here. Uh, so I'm setting my timer to, you know, make sure that I'm keeping in time. And what I want to talk um, about today within the 10 hour, uh, 10 minutes that I have allotted here is about some of the litigation uh, and challenges to the anti-CRT state bans, uh, particularly the developments uh, in this area as they continue to emerge uh, and put it in conversation with some of the historical context um, as well as uh, the research, the educational research that talks about particular trends uh, regarding the student populations that are uh, negatively affected by these bans. And so to start off, uh, I want to historicize here that as we uh, know and have seen, this curricular disputes in the K-12 context are really um, contemporary in nature, but truly rooted in a history uh, of debates and disputes around what languages can be taught? What do we include in the curriculum? Who is allowed to be an educator in this context? And so this particular uh, you know, broader debates from anywhere from the textbooks to more nitty gritty curriculum issues uh, to free speech rights in the you know, educational context have very concrete uh, legal and policy implications, right? And we have seen the courts uh, grapple with these um, in, in many ways, educational policy issues that are brought to the legal arena. Uh, and they have tried to truly strike a balance between um, 
both democratic goals of education, right? This idea that our schools are essentially preparing citizens for our democracy. And because of that, our public uh, K through 12 schools play a truly central, important role um, in the United States. But they have balanced that as well with parental rights and of course, student rights uh, themselves. Now, the debate has really led to discussions around uh, local control policy issues, uh, individual rights of teachers, employers, employees, um, and students and the like. And I think these are important to keep in mind because the contemporary disputes and challenges that we see today are drawing on some of these very foundational notions of what it means to maintain a balance uh, between our uh, schools as democratic institutions and the rights that the stakeholders have in the debate. Now, as Quinn uh, alluded to earlier, education issues are often uh, politicized. It is highly local and it is highly uh, contentious in many ways. So historically, there have been uh, movements that uh, more generally counter, and I have this in quotes here, what has been referred to as progressive or liberal advances in K through 12 education. And so here is a picture from one of those more contemporary groups, Moms for Liberty. It is a fairly active group within the context of the anti of the yeah anti CRT uh, state bans. And so the movements had really tried to focus in the discussion the rights of parents uh, and more of that local control uh, discussion. Now this is all happening. The politicization happens uh, in tandem with some of what the educational research has found and has come into um, pretty general consensus about. So for example, the importance of um, having a history curriculum that truly acknowledges some of the more thorny and probably, you know, at times brings discomfort in terms of the race dynamics or the LGBTQ plus uh, rights and gender, so on and so forth. Earlier on in the conversation, in the symposium, uh, socio-emotional learning was brought up. That is also now part of uh, what educational research has shown um, are important for our students to thrive, not only in the classroom, but post-graduation um, once they graduate from our K through 12 institutions. So again, political nature of things ongoing, and uh, we're in a particular time in, you know, in our history where we're also experiencing what uh, educational researchers and other researchers have called uh, the browning of America in schools. So I wanna just briefly show what that looks like in context uh, so that we can further contextualize the issues here with the, with the bans. Um, but this is a graph here that shows a proportion of non-white students in our K through 12 public schools. And you can tell that it's been rising significantly and very much in an inverse kind of way, our white students have been declining. And this maps out uh, from 1955 to 2020. Now, even though the proportion of students of color has significantly risen in the you know, prior decades, it doesn't mean that we are necessarily uh, you know, having more diverse educational institutions. So as you can tell here with this graph, uh, our schools are fairly segregated, right? And so we're still having uh, discussions about integration decades, decades and decades after uh, you know, that foundational Brown versus Board of Education case. So now to the more contemporary issues here. Um, in 2020, the country, if you all recall, had what some scholars and some people in the popular media refer to as a racial reckoning in the United States that's, that was prompted by the uh, death of George Floyd. Now, this had clear and concrete implications for educational institutions uh, because there was a large discussion in these particular institutions about what else they could do to embed discussions of racism, historical oppression, anti-bias training, and the like. And so as those discussions were evolving, our federal government also got involved in the discussion. So here um, is where you know, former President Trump back in 2020 issued an executive order 
uh, that prohibited, in essence, what they termed, quote unquote, divisive concepts in federal training. That was sort of the attempt of the executive order. And it was in particular response to the George Floyd uh, murder and the increased interest in discussions around uh, racial justice and anti-bias more generally. Now it was challenged and partially struck down and then eventually the Biden administration did revoke it once it came into office. But this executive order uh, has sort of created the genesis of many of the CRT uh, bans that we have seen across the nation. So here is the language. It's not the entire language from the executive order, but some of the key pieces of it. So describing divisive concepts, uh, just I'm not going to read through all of it, but just highlighting, for example, uh, you know, divisive concepts might mean that one race or sex is inherently superior to another race or sex. Uh, so this broader concept got adopted into some of the legislation. So as the um, executive order is no longer in place, though, the state legislations picked up some of that language. And what you see here is a map, uh, you know, broadly construed it looks, you know, it represents our United States here. And more than anything, the CRT bans as of earlier uh, this past week, March 23rd. And so this is where things stand across the United States. They've, they've been, you know, just briefly 44 states introducing bills or, or taking some sort of measure to ban, um, you know, discussions of divisive concepts, discussions of what we have come to now know as critical race theory, which is really a term to encompass uh, discussions of sexism, racism, um, and so on and so forth. More concretely, 18 states have actually imposed bans or restrictions, and they target generally racism, sexism, systemic inequality in the classroom. So it can look really different from state to state. And put here an example from Pennsylvania uh, that didn't pass it. It's, you know, stalled in the process, though. Some patterns across this particular legislative bans, they do mimic the language of 139.50. They prohibit divisive concepts and they target what uh, educators think or along the lines of discussing the history of enslavement um, potentially. And I say potentially because there is uh, some clarification around the bans with folks arguing that it might be more about not taking a side and presenting things in a more um, you know, neutral manner. Uh, book bans are also part of the CRT bans. And here's just a graphic of the types of, um, you know, the number of bans that have been introduced across the country. You can see here more of it being on the Southern area. And I've have about two minutes, so I'm just gonna jump over here. This is an example just of the kinds of books that have been banned either because they center uh, authors of color or characters of color or the LGBTQ plus community. So as all these bans are being adopted across the country, there are anti-CRT uh, ban litigation that is emerging and more broadly uh, different measures to try to counter some of that legislation from going into, into action. And so here's some examples uh, from like federal law, which typically encompasses First Amendment, free speech rights, 14th Amendment, due process rights. Um, the state constitutional issues are also coming up. So as in Arizona, where they are challenging through state law and the Supreme Court of the state in that particular case ended up striking down uh, the CRT, anti-CRT ban. Um, there are other kinds of disputes that you can see here, such as uh, simply requesting public records to determine whether a ban uh, has some sort of animus behind it. And then just briefly, I will note, uh, I wanna highlight Burt versus O'Connor here. It's one of the earlier lawsuits in this particular area that is challenging the Oklahoma, Oklahoma HB 1775. As you can tell, it matches some of the executive order uh, language here. And so it, it pretty much mirrors it. And then the last thing that I just wanna highlight here, I'm gonna jump here. There are some issues that we're seeing as patterns emerging in terms of like the empirical um, implications of this. 
So there's a concern of overcompliance. So uh, educators self-censoring themselves or being pushed out and leaving the profession altogether. We're yet to see how the courts are going to fully flesh out this particular legal doctrines that have been longstanding. There's discussions emerging around undemocratic education and what that means, right? If, they, if these institutions are nurseries of democracy, how do we have an input in what they particularly share? And again, questions of resources of uh, being allocated to counter some of the legislation instead of focusing on some of the educational issues. So I'm gonna wrap up there and I'm gonna turn it over to our moderator. Thank you so much. So we do have a, a couple of minutes for questions. I do have one question from the audience um, for you, Dr. Munez. And that question is, is the drop in the percentage of white students, is that just because there are fewer white students or could it be that more white students are attending private school? That is, a, that's an excellent question. Um, I'm actually, I think generally, so the sociology literature in this is that uh, America as a whole, uh, there is a drop in um, white students and more generally the white population. So that's reflective, but I think that's an interesting point there. It might also be uh, that similar to prior uh, phenomenons, for example, like white flight, we are seeing uh, the private schools taking in uh, white students. And so that might account for some of it, though not all of the drop. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> so I have a question. Let me see if, if there are any more questions from the audience, just let me know. But so I guess I'll start uh, with Linda first in this question is from your perspective and your interaction with school boards across Pennsylvania, how do you think our institutions are holding up given this increase in politiz politicization of public education? I will say that it's very divisive. Um, uh, the part of the, the Quinn's presentation about partisan elections versus nonpartisan elections. We have always considered our school board elections to be nonpartisan because they can cross file. So they can run as, as a Democrat and run as a Republican. Um, but what happened um, when the pandemic started is you had folks that said, hey, I want to go on the school board and, and get rid of critical race theory. I want to go on the school board and, and do this, that, and the other thing. And what's happened, not in every school, but in many, is they've become at a, a, you know, a standstill. Nothing's getting done because they're at the standstill and they're fighting with each other. So our organization has been trying to go in and do what I call can't we all get along trainings. Um, to help the boards work together and become a team instead of be so divisive. And we've been somewhat successful and we're still working on others. And so um, Quinn, I guess I'll throw it over to you. Um, the point that Linda just made was actually a point I was thinking of during your presentation that um, in Pennsylvania, we do have this tradition of cross-filing, which has meant that as a voter, unless you're super motivated, it can be very difficult to tell the political affiliation of who you're actually voting for because um, candidates will run in both the Republican and the Democratic primary. So then when it gets to the general election, it's not entirely clear you know, who's of what political affiliation. And so I was just wondering if you had any, had any thoughts on that or anything else that you've noticed about Pennsylvania specifically in terms of our school board election. So the idea of cross-filing or fusion nominations is something that's very, very old in our country. Um, it is largely on the decline from the early 1900s. Um, and so it, it's something that I could imagine, you know, going away in Pennsylvania in the coming years. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I think getting to the point that the harder it is for voters to be able to um, officially ascertain somebody's ideology, you're, I mean, the data is generally clear, you're going to see less, fewer people participating in that particular election, either they're not going to go to the polls if there's an election specifically for that, or they're going to skip that on their ballot. 
Um, or they're going to favor um, other sort of soft indicators. They're going to favor incumbents. They're going to favor people with names that to them sound white, Anglo-Saxon, Protestant a lot of the time. Um, and, you know, the thing is that at the end of the day that, you know, we all know in nonpartisan elections, if you want to find out somebody's ideology, it's not impossible to do. Um, and in some states, it's more obvious than others. And we see this in judicial elections all the time with like, what words are, is somebody using in what context? Who have they been endorsed by? Um, and it's just sort of a, a way of, you know, doing an end run around the process. But I, I think at the end of the day, it really comes down to what our goal is in school board elections. Is our goal having people who are who ideologically match the people that are voting for them? Um, is our goal to have this sort of uh, idyllic view of truly nonpartisan education administration? If that's our goal, I really don't think that's possible in today's climate. Um, and this is something where I, and this is a definitely a hotter take, I think, but I think I question the very reason that we have school board elections in the first place. I question the value of democracy sometimes because if voters aren't able to make informed decisions, if voters go and they don't know who they're voting for, they don't have any of these indicators, um, and we're seeing these really charged elections where it's being decided by fractions of the population sometimes, I guess I question what the role of democracy is in that more generally. Thank you. And I'll wrap things up with a question for Professor Archer. And, and that is, um, could you just talk a little bit more about the, the role of the school resource officer? Um, obviously, restorative justice is a part of it. But, but what, and I mean, I know it may be different in different districts or even in different schools, but what's generally the motivating force behind having them in schools in the first place? Well, I think security, right, is, is a big part of it. And one of the things that's interesting about Pennsylvania is, so Pennsylvania actually has three categories, school resource officers, school police officers, and school security guards. Um, but one of the interesting distinctions between a school resource officer and a school police officer, as I understand it, uh, is that school police officers can arrest and detain, school resource officers cannot. In many states, those roles are conflated, right? So if you're the school resource officer, um, you, you have the power uh, to arrest and detain students. And most of the um, Fourth Amendment cases that I was looking at were cases where the school resource officer exercised that power. So I think the security is part of it, but I think also many um, sheriff's offices, police departments see this as a way to actually improve community policing relationships um, by having, you know, officers embedded in schools uh, so that the students feel comfortable right, with, with police officers and sort of see police officers as people who are mentors and who are protecting them um, and see them, see them as a helpful presence. And indeed, many school resource officers see themselves that way. That, you know, if you're a police officer who volunteers to go into a school, it's because you like kids and want to mentor kids in some respect. Thank you so much. Thank you um, to all of our panelists for your time and sharing your expertise. And with that, I am going to turn things back over to Longview. Our next pa panel, as I said, um, is on vindicating the rights to education. And our panelist is a senior attorney at the Public Interest Law Center. Uh, uh, attorney Dan Urevic Ecclesburg, and I'm very much apologize if I didn't pronounce that correctly. Attorney um, Urevic Ecclesburg work includes leading the Law Center's litigation team in Pennsylvania's landmark school funding trial. Prior to joining the Law Center, Attorney Urevic Ecclesburg was an attorney at Community Legal Services, an assistant chief counsel for the Pennsylvania Human Relations Commission and a law clerk to the Honorable Cheryl Ann Krause of the United States Court of Appeals for the thir Third Circle, and the R I'm so sorry, and the Honorable Philip Restrepo of the United States District Court for the Eastern District of Pennsylvania. Attorney Urevic Ecclesburg graduated from McAllister College with a BA in Political Science and earned his JD from the University of Pennsylvania Law School. Welcome.
Thank you very much. And um, I, um, if uh, Professor Lee jumps in, I, I want to sort of pivot a little bit from I think what we're going to do, and then and then when when he jumps on, we can kind of switch back to that. Um, but thanks for having me. Um, it's uh, it's an honor. I'm not sure how I got picked to be the person to sort of <laughs> to, to to represent this case. I am a senior attorney at the Public Interest Law Center, where I did lead our um, legal team in um, in the school funding litigation that um, I'm mostly going to talk to you about today. That said, that was very much a, a joint effort across a number of organizations, um, uh, including um, the Education Law Center, which is um, another legal nonprofit um, based out of um, Philadelphia, and uh, the firm of Melvin and Myers. Um, my organization is the Public Interest Law Center is a um, about a 50 year old uh, civil rights law firm. Um, it came out of the um, the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights Under Law. We are an affiliate of the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights Under Law, um, and we bring impact litigation cases um, in a number of subject areas, um, from um, voting to healthcare to education, employment. Um, all the way to um, to education, um, which is sort of what gets us here today. Um, so, as we're waiting for Professor Lee, I think it's useful just to start um, by talking about um, sort of how we got here. What was the problem? So, again, uh, our organization, you know, was one of the organizations that led the charge in the school funding litigation. But why did we need this litigation to begin with? And um, I think that um, there's really um, a number of sort of thematic issues. The first is that in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania for a long time, there'd been, there's been no goal of actually fully funding public schools. So in other words, it's not like each year the, the state legislature gets together and says, okay, um, what do we need to give our schools this year and how do we do it? You know, what do schools need to do this year for whatever our goal is for them? Instead, the way we've traditionally funded public schools is we look at what schools got the year before and we give them a little bit more than we gave them. Um, and so there is no conversation of, there is no goal of fully funding public schools at the state level. At the local level, oftentimes there is, right? And oftentimes those conversations of what our schools need do happen so long as you can afford to do it, right? So if you're in a well-funded suburban school district, you know, the superintendent goes to the board at the start of the year and says, you know, here is the program I'd like to um, I'd like to implement for, for our goals this year. The board figures out how to pay for it, right? Sometimes you might need to raise taxes. Other times the money is just coming in. But in low wealth communities in Pennsylvania, the conversation is like, generally speaking, is what can we afford to do this year? Or what do we have to cut this year? Um, the, that stems from the fact that, um, relatively speaking, Pennsylvania makes a low contribution to education funding. Um, so of every dollar that's spent in K-12 education in the Commonwealth, only 38% of it comes from the state. And so what that means is really heavily reliant on local communities to pay for their schools. And some of them can do that. We have some well-funded suburban schools um, because their communities can come up with the funds. Um, but for others, that's just simply not possible. Um, another thematic problem is that most of our funding is not based on any rational formula. Um, and then all of that together creates um, not just inadequate funding, but gross disparities from district to district to district. Um, and when you step all the way back, you have a system where um, the lowest wealth communities in Pennsylvania um, need the most, try the hardest, and have the least. Um, and I'm just going to keep, I think what I'm going to do, and my sort of pivot here, is I'm going to actually try to share my screen. So bear with me for a minute. There we go. Um, okay. So um, how did we get here? Um, so we brought um, litigation challenging challenging our, our system of school funding. We brought it on behalf of school districts, statewide organizations, and parents. Um, the school districts that challenged this system um, really represented a cross-section of the Commonwealth, um, urban, suburban, and rural school districts, um, as well as parents, in Wilkes-Barre, um, the William Penn School District, who is a plaintiff, and the School District of Philadelphia, um, and two statewide organizations, the NAACP, uh, Pennsylvania Conference, and the Pennsylvania Association of Rural and Small Schools. Um, 
you know, the case was filed because we have really a generation or, or generations of underfunding in Pennsylvania. Um, but it was also filed in the aftermath of really significant budget cuts in 2012 across the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, where about $900 million was cut from um, school funding. So there's a real desperation um, to, to sort of open the courthouse doors um, again, or I'm sorry, to, to bring this sort of litigation. Um, but there was a barrier, which is that litigation had been tried before and it had failed. Um, so um, in the late 1990s, there were two um, sets of school funding litigation uh, brought under Pennsylvania state constitution um, against the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania for the failure to adequately fund its public schools. Uh, one was brought by the Pennsylvania Association of Rural and Small Schools, um, a, a petitioner in this case, and one was brought um, by the School District of Philadelphia. Um, and those cases eventually ended at the Supreme Court, where the Supreme Court said, um, pursuant to something called the political question doctrine, that the Supreme Court was not equipped to determine what an adequate education was under the Pennsylvania Constitution, and thus um, abstained from hearing the case at all. And so when the case was filed, there was a big question as to whether we would have to go to the Supreme Court again just to get the opportunity to bring, to bring the case. And so the case was filed in late 2014. It was dismissed by Commonwealth Court in 2015, citing those earlier cases. In 2016, we had argument before the Supreme Court. And in 2017, the Supreme Court reopened uh, the courthouse doors um, to these types of cases. Um, you know, and what the Supreme Court said, um, and again, I'm going to get into the specifics, but this was, again, a case brought under the Education Clause of the Commonwealth Constitution and the Equal Protection Provisions of the Commonwealth Constitution. And um, what the Supreme Court said, it was really sort of foundational um, Marbury versus Madison. I mean, it literally was Marbury versus Madison type stuff um, that, you know, um, we have to, a court has to be able to evaluate a constitutional right, because if there's no ability to review that right, um, then, then where are we, right? Without, with, with no remedy, there is no right. Um, and they said, you know, we, we can only abstain in the most narrow cases, and this is not one. Um, reopening the, the courthouse doors. And one of the things they said is, you know, if, um, if, if we treat education just like everything else government does, right? We don't actually, um, we don't actually allow claims brought under it, education is in the constitution, we don't allow claims brought under it, um, then it's inevitable that education will simply jostle with everything else the government does, right? And if, and if that's the case, and like, why is it in the constitution to begin with? Um, so we went back to Commonwealth Court, the case was remanded back to Commonwealth Court. Um, and um, we then had additional motions to dismiss our case or preliminary objections to dismiss our case. And um, finally, in January of 2019, entered into discovery. Discovery was a long process. Um, it was nearing the end when COVID occurred. Um, but eventually, um, we had a trial. Um, trial concluded in, or started in November of 2021, um, concluded in March of 2022. Um, 49 trial days, dozens of witnesses. This is, of course, the decision itself. Um, 15,000 pages of transcripts, 1,700 exhibits. Um, it was it was a lot of work, uh, a lot of work for us, a lot of work for our opposing counsel, a lot of work undoubtedly for the court. Um, but we had a trial um, where we were alleging that the system of uh, funding Pennsylvania uh, school fund, uh, sorry, the, the Pennsylvania school funding system was unconstitutional. Um, and again, if Randy is here, I'm happy that he can just jump in, but I'm going to keep going. Um, all right, so um, I'm going to show you some of the court's own findings um, from the decision uh, itself. Um, the first thing that the court had to do in this case foundationally, so that the Pennsylvania Constitution says the, gen the General Assembly shall provide for the maintenance and support of a thorough and efficient system of education to serve the needs of the Commonwealth. And um, the first thing the court had to do, because this really was um, a case of first impression, is actually decide what the education clause requires the General Assembly to provide. It had never clearly been set out. What does that education clause require? Um, and here's how the court answered the question, looking at the history of the education clause um, and the plain language of the clause itself. The court said, um, first, 
The education clause requires that every student in the Commonwealth be provided with a meaningful opportunity to succeed academically, socially, and civically. That's the first part of the sentence, right? But what does it mean to give every student a meaningful opportunity? Well, to give every student a meaningful opportunity, that requires, second, that all students have access to a comprehensive, effective, and contemporary system of public education, right? So that you judge the opportunity by whether students are actually getting the comprehensive, effective, and contemporary system of education that the clause mandates. Um, the second thing the court had to decide is what right, if any, is there, what constitutional right, if any, is there to education itself? Um, I think, you know, if you asked a person on the street, they would say, of course, there's a right to education, right? But that was a hot topic, whether the Constitution, um, the equal protection provisions of the Constitution, and the education clause of the Constitution, along with other some other parts of the, of the Constitution, grant um, children a right to education. And here the court said, yes, it does. Um, that um, that um, the plain language of the Constitution and the history of the education clause leads to one conclusion that public education is a fundamental right explicitly and or implicitly derived from the Pennsylvania Constitution. So you start from those two premises, um, or those two sort of uh, uh, legal foundations, and then you move on to what we did, what the court found we did and did not prove. And I'm gonna sort of skip around um, as we go here. So I apologize for the choppiness of the, um, of the PowerPoint. Dan, um, if I could just jump in here for a second, um, and apologize for for my mix up on time, but I was wondering I'm if you could talk this a little. This is Sorry. this is me, by the way, Dan Randy. Yeah, um, yeah. I wanted to ask you if you could talk a little bit more about the nature of the right to education, both as a right and and also struck me that the court kind of divided that right into two rights or two dynamics. And I was wondering if you could kind of talk a little bit about what they said that right actually was. Sure. So um, so um, let's start with equal protection. Um, so, or I, I guess bro more broadly, if we step back, you know, people I think are often familiar with, you know, the negative rights that are, you know, um, most associated with the Bill of Rights, you know, um, um, you know, the 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 inability to infringe upon X, Y, or Z, from free speech to due process and on and on. And um, but state constitutions obviously can be a little bit different. And state constitutions can demand positive action. Um, and that's really what we have in the education context, right? So unlike a traditional, the traditional sort of negative rights jurisprudence, here you have an obligation upon a body to provide a thing, which is, you know, not at all our, our normal sort of federal constitution. And frankly, there's not much of that in the Pennsylvania constitution either. There are a couple of other clauses, which um, either explicitly or implicitly, I think, um, put upon uh, uh, an affirmative duty to act for someone else. Um, but um, there's not much, education is one. And um, so that creates some challenges in how you evaluate whether they're doing it. Um, but the right, I think, at its core is the right to an education, the, fo the foundational right to an education that is contemporary and effective. I mean, I think that it's not, it's not the right to anything. It's not the right to anything that, be, that can be called an education. Um, you know, as, as long as it's a thing that is called a school, it has to be um, meaningful. It has to be an education that has the markers of what the framers intended, which is an education that's designed um, to start to allow um, students to, to succeed in a democracy and to succeed um, in, in contemporary society. Um, does that answer the question? Yeah, I think I think one of the, the big things, and not to make you repeat yourself, but the dynamic that we're dealing with here of a what you call the positive right or a positive action. We're used to that, that notion of a right as being, this is something I have the government can't interfere with. Yep. And what you're pressing for here under the Pennsylvania Constitution is something that the government is required to make happen. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. And, and it actually creates some challenges in terms of, not challenges, but it creates... Um, 
it means that the fu the foundational legal analysis is not is the same as it is like because you're uh, under a traditional sort of infringement case. You know, is the government overstepping its bounds? Is something that courts do all of the time. Has the government done enough? Have they done their duty? Um, is something that's far less frequently brought um, because it's again, it's just less frequent. It's almost entirely absent from federal law, and it's less frequent in state law. And and I think you you make a, a just an excellent point where all of this is going is. I think, and it's it's kind of where I interrupted you, so sorry about that, but no where all of this is going is, so what happens when we get to remedy? Mm -hmm. And and it's one thing for a court to say, leave him alone, right? I just, I, I want you to stop bothering him to, to the government. It's another thing to say, and I, I think this is kind of where we, where where you're headed. It's another thing to say, you have to put more money in the coffer to make something happen, right? And, and as we're approaching that moment where we kind of talk about the, you know, what happens next remedy dynamic, one more kind of thing that, that I'd like you to talk a little bit more about is when you, the, the notion of, okay, so we have a right to a contemporary, effective, meaningful education, which is, different from sort of the equal protection dynamic that you also have going on where I'm entitled to an education equal to what these other people in the next county are getting, which is different from I'm entitled to a really good education that would make me all that I possibly could be. Yeah, so I, I think that um, so it's it's an interest, it's a little bit unsettled, but I think that um, the way that I view the edge, the equal protection clause is not that it has to not that it de demands exact certainly doesn't demand uniformity. Right. And it doesn't demand exact equality. Right. It doesn't say, um, you know, your exact um, your your exact. Uh, education that you give in district A has to be as good as it is in district B. But I do think it creates what what it really says is there's a, I think at least a threshold that every child is entitled to. And you've created this system where you have infringed upon the rights of the, those foundational rights and really only infringed upon the foundational rights of children in low wealth districts. And so it's not to say that their education needs to be exactly the same, but they need to have a quality of access to the education that the constitution itself demands. Like whatever that floor is, and here I guess it's an effective contemporary education, right? A meaningful opportunity to succeed. Is that ev like the equality is the, the ability to get to that level. So you still could have, you know, a suburban district, you know, um, so outside of Philadelphia, where, where I currently am, you know, Lower Marion or Radnor, sort of the most the the, the most well known sort of higher wealth suburban districts, you know, they can have more bells and whistles than the William Penn School District in Delaware County. But what we can't, but it does violate, we believe, equal protection to create a system where the children in low wealth districts don't actually have the education the Constitution requires. If I, I could just, and again, I'm kind of holding you back from the thing that, that everybody wants to get to, but a couple of things that, that I just wanted to touch on. One is, and, and you may have already mentioned this, but it's something that, that you argued that just really hit me. Um, when you mentioned low wealth district, and I think that's, that's a really important labeling because I was really struck, and again, you may have already mentioned this, that sort of my natural thought process is to say, if a, if a district wants to spend more money per, per capita on students, they should be able to choose to do that. And, and the whole thing will kind of take care of itself. But, but you had a, a chart that you put together, and a lot of the districts that spend the most per capita per student are taxing at the lower at a lower percentage rate. 
So, and, right. and, it, and it is, it's a dynamic of having a, 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 a larger property tax basis to start from. So it's not like I'm choosing to tax my people at a higher rate to provide more per capita per student. It's just, I am fortunate to be in a district where we've got this huge base to start out with, and I'm actually taxing people at a lower rate. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. So I, I said this only in the briefest at the beginning when I say the low, lowest wealth communities try the hardest, uh, need the most, try the hardest and have the least. But yeah, I mean, so local control was this big thing that was, it's always bandied about in these cases. And um, in, in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, by rate, low wealth communities tax their communities higher than high wealth communities. That doesn't mean they generate enough that they generate more funds, right? They don't have the wealth to tax. So, you know, they don't have a big shopping malls. They don't have big mansions. Um, so, so even though they do try harder, they simply don't have the funds. That's first. Second, they also have the students that the Commonwealth admits need more resources. So they need more. They're trying harder and they still have less. Um, and, you know, we really saw this at the trial where, um, you know, the William Penn School District, I think taxes the second highest, the second highest rate of 499 school districts um, in this, the greater Johnstown School District, greater Johnstown in Cambria County, really a, um, you know, a town that has been hit hard by deindustrialization, lost a huge percentage of its population, its major industries. Um, in that school district, um, they finally decided, I mean, we have to raise taxes, even though by median income, I think it's the very poorest school district in the Commonwealth. And so they raised taxes just to try to, you know, it wasn't going to do much. It wasn't going to get them much, but it was going to tr try to close a, a budget deficit that existed. And the next year, they actually took in less funds because the property in their district, the only thing they have to rely upon to, to, to provide for their kids is not only worth so little, but homeowners reassess their properties and in greater Johnstown, the values are actually going down. So yeah, like the, the low wealth communities are trying hard, which is why the idea of local control, local control is an excuse for all of this is, is truly illusory because they're trying, right? It's not local preference. Their preference is to have good schools and they, they exhibit that in everything they do, but they just can't come up with it. And, you know, and, and just one, one, one more second about this, you know, there's a real obvious logical fallacy in the idea that providing school districts more funding from the state somehow hurts local control, right? So uh, there was a comment about uh, about like local school boards and democracy. I obviously, in this case, represent six local school boards, so I will you know su suggest that that is not um, my position. But um, but like those districts, um, if you give them more funds, they actually have more freedom to give their kids what they need, right? To hire the teachers, the reading specialists, and on and on. There's nothing that would suggest that if you give them more funding, like they have less ability to use it. I mean, in fact, we just, again, we see this play out with, with suburban districts all the time. So that's a long answer, but. No, I think it's a great answer. And, and again, I think it, it kind of goes back to that notion that we need to remember that we're dealing here with what you labeled as an affirmative right, right? So, so we're not talking now about that, that traditional notion of leave somebody alone so they can do what they want. We're talking about somebody has an obligation to do something affirmatively. And you're yeah. right, I can't fulfill the right if I don't have any resources. If you've told me I have an obligation to provide something to someone, but then you've placed me in a position where I can't generate the resources to make that happen. It's just a completely untenable situation. Um, Agreed. Dan, one of the things that, and, and I think this is kind of a segue and I'll finally let you get back to, to what you wanted to do, but, but again, it's sort of that law professor curiosity in me. Um, nice segue into sort of a discussion of what the court did and, and the remedies they come up with as you're talking about, okay, so we're trying to enforce a right to a contemporary, effective, meaningful education and, and trying to figure out what equal educational opportunities mean on the equal protection side. Um, before you could get to the trial, you had to show that you did not have a political question. Yeah. 
And I thought that you did a masterful job of getting over that hurdle because I think, I think just the, I mean, part of the, for those of you who are not familiar with it and why would anybody be familiar with it who wasn't immersed in it, but political question is just whether the court has jurisdiction to hear the case. Is this the kind of case courts hear? And, and some of the, the issues that come up with there, do, would a court have a discoverable and manageable set of standards for resolving the question? Or is this going to be pulling the court into a lot of subjective policy determinations? Or how is this going to put the court vis-a-vis -vis other branches of government? And you, and I, I was wondering if you just kind of talk about in your mind how you figured out how do we create standards that a court can use to figure out how do they meet the rights and the obligations that are presented here? So when the case was first filed, you know, and there was, um, I, I did talk a little bit about some of this earlier um, precedent. There's this earlier precedent that existed. And um, our our complaint, the or it's called a petition for review, but the, the complaint um, really sort of said two reasons why that old precedent should not control. And frankly, that old precedent was, I think, terrible, but um, why that old precedent should not control. The first was that um, you know, in the in the 1990s, what the court said is like, how, how do we measure what an adequate education is? Okay. We, we then move into sort of a standard, the, the movement to a standards-based education, right? Where everyone is learning, in theory, at least the same standards, or at least is learning some of the same standards. Everyone is being assessed on those state standards. And then there's consequences attached to the failure to meet those state standards. That's first. So the General Assembly, the State Board of Education, the Pennsylvania Department of Education have all laid out what kids should be learning in, in an in sort of a, a, a modern educational system. That's first. And then second, they test them on that. And then third, um, in 2007, 2008, Pennsylvania actually itself conducted a study or hired a third party to conduct a study to say, how much funding do we actually need to get this done? And then that study said, well, we need about, we're underfunding education by about $4 billion. And so that was sort of the, the path to say to the Commonwealth Court, for example, and eventually the Supreme Court, why it was different this time, why you didn't have to, um, you know, why, why we could, why we didn't need to overturn that precedent to move forward. That said, the Supreme Court didn't exactly buy that argument. I mean, they didn't, they didn't, they didn't take that argument. I mean, they took the, the broader argument that there is there are standards, but they actually just swept away the old precedent really altogether. And they said that they, they called that old precedent it was three cases. They said it was um, three legs of an unstable stool and they just they wiped it away, um, which really left us sort of a clear field to say, OK, um, how do we go about measuring what an educational system needs? And so what what I why I think that we are successful in part at the at the back at the Commonwealth Court when we went back to trial is what we showed is that in the 21st century there's largely a consensus for what the education like a modern educational system needs. Yes, there's assessments, but there's also all sorts of other ways you measure success, and there's shared common goals. Does anyone believe that a modern education system shouldn't leave a child ready to be prepared academically, socially, and civically? I mean, it's like so common sense and you can measure it a number of different ways. And so that kind of reopened the field to us. And we did use sort of we really relied on a lot of the state's own admissions as to what kids need, how you how you achieve success for kids and what the end goals of the system are. So we started sort of with an, um, a little bit of a narrower um, argument because there was this precedent. But then the Supreme Court really wiped away that precedent, which which um, created a little bit of a broader feel where we still had our sort of the core to our original argument, but it didn't have to be quite so narrow. So you you kind of get to write on a, a blank slate. What happens? That's so. So now you can jump into where you were before I started interrupting. No, no, I don't. I don't. I mean, I, I'm, I'm happy just to. That was that. I, I was that was my vamping. I'm happy just to talk with you all. I mean, we we talked about the the right and what we established, and then how we proved it. 
And so you jump in whenever you want, but how we proved it was, or what the court found was um, first that a modern educational system, well, let's start with a basic premise. The court said foundationally, there's a one premise that's important here. All children can learn, which is, I guess, fairly obvious, but was actually a contested issue. You know, is it, is, 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 um, is, are they the huge achievement gaps that we see in Pennsylvania? Are they just a natural order of things, even though they're bigger than virtually any state in the country, right? Or are they caused by something? Are the huge differences in how a low-income child performs in a high-spending different, a high-spending district versus how a low-income student performs in a low-spending district? Are those sort of the natural order of things? No, they're not, right? They're caused by the lack of resources in those schools. The Pennsylvania Department of Education said it was a root cause um, of our of our gaps. And um, so the court started with that premise, looked at how we were doing, took in lots and lots of testimony from educators about what they could and could not provide to their students. Her testimony from the Department of Education, from the Board of Education, about what they know children need, what strategies work for kids, what they know about the disparities in Pennsylvania. And then it heard from expert witnesses about what kids need, about the role that funding plays, and on and on and on. And so what, what the court said is, all right, I, I understand that all kids can learn. I see that, um, that um, the results are on the back end are um, very, very lacking. And on the front end, what I see is superintendents that cannot provide the markers of a modern education, right? Sufficient numbers of professional staff, um, whether those are teachers or interventionists or counselors, on and on, um, safe, adequate facilities, um, uh, instrumentalities of learning, not just books and chairs, but things like technology and an adequate curriculum that I see they're not able to provide those things. I also see that the state has admitted various times that we're not funding our system. Um, and then I, I determine there is a causal link for the lack of funding, the lack of the ability to provide the modern, the, the, the basic sort of foundational tenets of a modern education system with the way these kids are actually performing. And so connecting all the dots there, what I determine is the education clause is not being complied with. There is a violation of the constitution. So that's sort of what we, what we proved. And could you talk a little bit about what the court came back with as a remedy here? I mean, you won. Mm -hmm. So what did you win? Um, so, well, what we won is a judgment that, that the, the first, what the education clause requires, second, that it's not being met, third, that education is a fundamental right, fourth, that, that, that um, low-wealth children are being discriminated against, children in low-wealth districts are being discriminated against. It was a declaration. Um, and a command from the court um, in the end of his decision to say, say, okay, but now it's um, the responsibility of the General Assembly and the executive branch respondents. We were suing not just the General Assembly, but also the governor and the secretary of education and the board of education, that it's their opportunity now uh, working in conjunction with us to fix the system. So that is, and, and the, the order is, the final order itself is reasonably short. I think it's two pages. There's a 780, maybe three pages, 786 page decision. The order itself is, I think, short, really giving um, our opponents the opportunity to work in good faith to construct a system that actually is constitutionally compliant. Now, correct me, Deanne, if I'm wrong on this, but but my sense was that the 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 remedy did not require does not include a requirement that the state actually spend more money is that is that accurate i don't think that's accurate no i mean i think that the court found repeatedly quarter's decision over and over that there was insufficient funding in the system so i don't think there's any way to bring the system in compliance without adding significant more funding like there there's no um, what the court found through various measures was state admissions that there's actually inadequate funds in the system uh, right now. So, so the ledges just so I'm clear. So there, there is a requirement in the opinion that the legislature 
and the executive branch would commit more funding to education. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, and you go back to what sort of the, the most foundational thing the court found is like the inability, like, you know, this case isn't about money for money's sake, right? You know, we have these these sort of our, our academic debates about the impact of funding in education, but the reality is that money buys, pays for people's salaries, right? The people that actually teach the kids, the safe buildings, et cetera. And what the court found repeatedly is like that Lowell districts can't do that. And the reason why they can't do that is because the system is inadequately funded. What do you see? Are, and and again, I'm on the lookout. So if anybody else has questions, please. I did just get a question. If if you um, someone sent one to me, hold on one second. Okay. Um, so um, um, John King um, said, "Who who was the opponent in this case?" Do you want me to, Randy? Should I just go through that quickly? Sure. So we sued um, basically anyone with a uh, what we thought to be a constitutional responsibility to fix the problem. So that meant um, the governor, the secretary of education. As a side note, the secretary of education is the only member of the governor's cabinet required by the Pennsylvania Constitution. So there's, you know, you can eliminate by statute every other member of the cabinet. You can't eliminate the secretary of education, um, the Pennsylvania Department of Education itself. The State Board of Education. So, so those are sort of like the executive branch parties. And then the head of the, the, the Senate, the, the president pro tem of the Pennsylvania Senate and the Speaker of the House. Um, so it was really anyone that had a responsibility to fix the problem, you know, people in their official capacities. So the identity of the parties changed repeatedly. When the case was filed, um, um, it was in the last month, I think, of the Tom Corbett administration. It then became Tom Wolf, and now is Josh Shapiro. Um, the Speaker of the House has changed three times, maybe four times. The President of the Senate has changed repeatedly. Um, so it's all these people in their official capacity, uh, but it's really the, the legislative and executive branches of our government. Yeah, and you mentioned there were some issues with, again, local control obviously is a concern here. Um, if the state is going to be putting more money into the system, do you think that there may be the potential for them wanting more control or more accountability on the other side then? Um, I mean, they, uh, they obviously have the, uh, the, the ability to demand what they want to demand. We already actually have lots of accountability for school districts. Um, we have lots of mandates and report reporting requirements for school districts. So, you know, they, they can mandate what they want. And I think that it, you know, it makes sense. I think in general, when, when you're hopefully overhauling a really inadequate funding system to, to create some sort of mechanism where you say, you know, what was this funding used for? You know, what, how many teachers were you able to hire with this new funding? You know, I, to, to sort of talk in practical terms to members of the public, um, but like we actually have, you know, we have high stakes tests, right? If, if in Pennsylvania, if you are a school district that is in the bottom percent, bottom 15%, if you're, if one, if you're, if you your school is in the bottom 15%, um, by test scores, you're labeled a low performing public school and children are given the opportunity to get essentially a voucher to leave, you know, so there are all these sorts of consequences that attach um, already um, to, to, our, to our system now. You may have already covered this, but I'm fascinated by this. Could you talk a little bit about um, what you do at the public interest? Like, how does the Public Interest Law Center function? And mm -hmm. what drew you into Picking up this case. I mean, here you are, and as you said, you, you've got Supreme Court precedent that says this is probably a bad idea, right? And yet you're like, this is where we want to invest our time, mm -hmm. right? So how did how how does the how do you guys all kind of figure out what you want to do and when you want to do it? 
So, okay. So a couple of things first, I, you know, I, I, I want to step back and say, yeah, you know, to all the, the law students out there. Um, one of the things I always tell people when they ask me if they should go to law school, I say the world needs more good lawyers. So, you know, for those thinking about public interest careers, I can just want to tell you that it is an extraordinarily rewarding way to spend your life. Um, and, um, so I will give you the perspective of our organization because I actually came after the complaint was filed, but obviously no, no quite quite a bit of of how um, how it came to be. Um, so both our organization and the Education Law Center, Public Interest Law Center, and the Education Law Center, um, were very much involved um, as advocates, as lawyers, in sort of the the broader um, education community. And so I, I talked a little bit, I did say a little bit at the beginning that, that, that in 2013, 2012, there's this awful series of cuts to school funding um, in the Commonwealth. And so there really was this desperation, you know, how it came to be to us. And I'll talk about how we, you know, maybe how we take cases generally the Public Interest Law Center. But I think how it came to both us and our, our colleagues at the Education Law Center is desperate people wanting to to try again, um, you know, that when the courts sort of closed, seemingly closed the door on litigation, you know, people did go through the political process, tried that, and here we were with just massive, awful budget cuts, um, really a, across the Commonwealth, you know, thousands of teachers being laid off, just really desperate straits. And so sometimes you have to take another swing. Um, and, and that's what we did, you know, with, with, again, a good argument as to why things were different this time, but also knowing that it was going to take, it was a long road ahead. Um, you know, at our organization broadly, we're a very small nonprofit. So we have 10 lawyers on staff total. We work in across six subject areas. And so unlike sort of a traditional legal aid organization, um, we don't have general intake. You know, someone doesn't come in. I, I spent the first couple of years of my career at Community Legal Services in Philadelphia, where I did a lot of mortgage foreclosure work, where like someone would come in the door saying, I have a mortgage foreclosure and I would take the case and represent them. At the Public Interest Law Center, we do almost all impact litigation, which is class actions, um, other sort of widespread cases or uh, sort of big impact cases. We, so we have to be extremely choosy about what we do because they take a ton of resources. We also always partner, not just with um, our, our friends at organizations like the Education Law Center, but we almost always partner with bigger firms on those cases because they can just bring a lot more firepower to the cause. Um, and that's exactly what happened here. I mean, Melvany, our, our, our colleagues at Melvany were extraordinary, but so we're very, very, very um, purposeful when we take on a case. When I file a case, I have already... Um, essentially gamed out the response to a motion to dismiss, like in detail. And we're not filing anything by the seat of our pants at the Public Interest Law Center. And I'm sure that's the same at, at the Education Law Center. Like we have very few resources, very few lawyers. And so when we go in, we have to be really purposeful because we want to go in and go in all the way. And um, so we're very, very, very careful. Um, and sometimes, frankly, slow. Um, as a result of that. Um, so, you know, again, it was a very, very sort of purposeful process, but born out of the desperation of people um, to take another crack at um, a system that was just failing kids across the across the Commonwealth. I want to pick up and a little bit different spin, but um, one, I've just really, I thought it was very powerful when you said, you know, desperate people wanting a chance, right? And and this is extraordinarily rewarding work. I want to talk about some other extraordinarily rewarding work that you've done because you are, in fact, correct me if I'm wrong, are or have been, we've kind of had this discussion a little bit, one of the top rowing athletes in really in the world, right? I mean, it's fair to say you've been to the world championships, um, represented the United States for the Olympic trials. Um, you are the real deal. And, and two questions that came to my mind, because some of this was going on while you were a law student, right? That's correct. I, mean, I feel like you're, you should be my press agent, Randy. So, <laughs> I'm not just being honest here, right? 
So uh, two questions came to my twisted mind. One was, did you feel more pressure racing to qualify for the Olympics, mm -hmm. taking the bar exam, or arguing the school funding case? Okay, that's question A. And question B is, of those, which of those experiences did you enjoy more? Which one was the most pressure filled mm -hmm. and which one was the one you enjoyed the most? So for 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 those who aren't you know familiar with my press clips, this was many years ago. Um, I I was fortunate enough um, starting in law school and then for a couple of years thereafter, I was a member of the U.S. national rowing team, represented the U.S. at various international races, including some world championships and Pan Am games and things like that. I wouldn't say I was one of the best in the in the world. I mean, I I, I didn't win any medals. Me. I was good. I wasn't, you know, I, I could have been better. Um, it was definitely high stakes. Actually, you know, it's interesting. I think um, uh, in terms of what I felt more pressure doing, I'm a pretty neurotic person. So I think I feel more pressure in, in any, in anything, but I will say that um, um, it's kind of like, it's kind of all the same, you know, you feel the pressure to perform. So I, I raced in, among other things, a single. I was uh, I represented the U.S. in one world championships as the lightweight men's single, and you know, you're sitting on the start line. It's just all by yourself. Um, um, I think I took a lot of those experiences and feeling how I did and did not deal with pressure well as a younger athlete um, to um, to do better as an attorney. The one thing I can say to to um, to you know practicing attorneys or to few, our future practicing attorneys is like, you know, everyone gets nervous, you know, like you stand up before a court. Like if you're not nervous, I, I don't know. I, I can't even, I couldn't even contemplate not being nervous when I stand up before a court. But I think that as I've gone through the, the years, I've just got much more comfortable with that. Like it doesn't show something's wrong. It's just like the natural order of things. That's how you should be nervous. And it's okay to be nervous and like, just embrace that. Um, I think the bar exam was definitely the worst of all of those things that you mentioned. Um, when you sit down, you take the bar exam. The first thing I realized is I understand why people fail the bar exam. I was fortunate enough not to, but like, there's just so many questions with like, I don't know, it's so long, could be one answer, could be another. And you think, man, if I'm having a bad day, I, I get a bad string of questions here. Like you realize like, okay, well, yeah, I, I see I see why that happens. And I, I don't think it necessarily... I frankly don't think the bar exam really bears upon your talent as a lawyer. Um, so I think that was my least enjoyable. Um, you know, I, I certainly had huge adrenaline wins as a rower um, and also some crushing defeats. <laughs> so, you know, come back to me if like this gets appealed to the Supreme Court and we lose, and then I'll tell you which I enjoyed the least. But But right now the moment is feeling pretty good. It's feeling good, yeah. Yeah. I mean, we devote it, you know, again, like it is in some ways unhealthy how much time we devoted to this single case. I mean, we had we had a lot of lawyers from our office, the Education Law Center, Old Melvin, just working on this over and over and over and over. And while it would have been a rewarding thing, and while we had to come to grips with the fact that like this was the right thing to do. So you have to come to grips with like losing, like we believed in this case, you know. Um, we believe in our clients. And so um, it would have, it would have been crushing if we lost, but we didn't lose. So it feels pretty good. Well, I, I think that's probably a great place to stop because the idea that, that we should feel really good when we win and it should hurt when we lose is probably a good thing for lawyers to remember because Again, we got people coming to us who are looking for a, a chance, and that's what's at stake. Um, but Jane, did you have anything to wrap up with? Oh, yes. 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 Thank you, Dan. Thank you. Um, yes, thank you. And you mentioned earlier why is it that you um, were invited, and I just want to let you know that it's something that the case uh, when I found out about it, the full seven hundred and forty some pages uh, of the opinion, it's something that really fascinated me, and I was really um, hoping that you will come, and you did, and it, it's great. Um, I live in a kind of 
less funded school district. And I have three kids. So it's, it was something that struck with me. So thank you. No problem. Um, and on that note, I would like to thank all the panelists again, all the moderators. And I'm not on a video. I apologize. That was kind of rude of me. Um, so thank you so much for taking your time. I know, I know as, as an attorney, as professors, your time is precious. So I really, really appreciate it. Um, thank you for all the registrants. It's been a really great turnout. Um, couldn't be happier. Also happy it's over with all the planning. But thank you again. And thank you, uh, Brian, for fantastic technical support. Thank you, Mark, for CLEs. Uh, please, please, please don't, remember, don't forget to fill out the survey that was sent in the chat. Uh, Mark will also follow up with you over the emails. You can fill it out um, and get the, your CLE credits. And yeah, so thank you so much. And I hope you have a wonderful weekend.